is the Holyoke City Council Finance Subcommittee. Uh, my name is Joe McGivern. I'm the chair. To my right, Peter Tallman. To my left, Kevin Jordan. To his left, Will Perrero. We also have Linda, Councilor Linda Bacon with us in the audience. And on Zoom, we have Councilor Tessa Murphy, Councilor Jenny Rivera. And at the moment, I believe that's it. We have a number of special guests and a very long agenda. <laughs> yes? We've got Juan and uh, Juan's part Council of the Council. Juan Anderson Burgos, my apologies. And Jose Maldonado. Where? Right down there. In the middle down below. Jose and Maldonado. Councilor Jose Maldonado. The last, yeah. My apologies. Well, we do have a long agenda. We're going to get right to it. Uh, this is a, <coughs> a, televised, a televised meeting which is being recorded. It's also being streamed. It's live on the Access channel, and it's also Zoomed uh, is how it's being recorded. So with that in mind, the chair will entertain a motion to take up items one and two as a package. Motion to take items one and two off the table for a pa as a package. Second. So, motion made second to take items one and two off the table for a package. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item one. Introduced by myself that thereby is hereby appropriate by transfer $18,881.72 from pay investigator to the National Service Officer, same amount. Item number two, the request for transfer from the pay investigator of $22,145.10 to the same line item pay National Service Officer, $22,145.10. We have our <coughs> director of the uh, Veterans Affairs with us, I hope. Jesus, I see you. I'm right here. Good evening, and thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, item number one can be withdrawn. Uh, originally, we thought it was $18,881 remaining in the account, and we currently actually have more than that. Uh, what we're trying to do is fund the National Service Officer position, which is the position that um, files claims against the Veterans Administration, so we'd have someone full-time all the time to do that. Currently, in the last five years, we've done almost a million dollars in claims, meaning that every year we get a million dollars in at least uh, at least in federal aid from the, the VA to veterans in the city of Holyoke. So having this position funded and uh, operating will help keep people off of our Chapter 115 rolls, which we've seen this the last couple of years, our, the amount we're spending on Chapter 115 is going down. And we just think it's 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 the next best step for, for the office. Hey Zeus, this is a new position or an existing position that's unfunded? It's an unfunded existing position. And who would, uh, do you have someone in mind that you're looking to hire or are you, or are you transferring someone? This would, have, this would have to go out to the public um, and we would have to interview uh, for it. Um, at, at no time are we looking to go more than three people in our office. We did lose our investigator, which is why we're pulling the money out of this position for the time being. Are you looking to replace the investigator? For the short period, I think ideally what we would want in this office is to have an investigator, a uh, national service officer and a director. I think that will cover all the bases in the long term. But currently this is the next step in trying to get to that process. So with this transfer, will both line items, both position, have enough money to do what you wish to do for the rest of the fiscal year? Yes. Yeah, so the $22,145 is the amount we're trying to transfer. That'll cover an investigator at the mid-grade, I'm sorry, a national service officer at mid-grade pay uh, for the remainder of the fiscal year. And could you tell us at the beginning of next fiscal year what the salaries would be for each of these line items? Uh, so your national service officer is the mid grade is about uh, 52, 53. Low grade is high 40s. The investigator, uh, like 37,000. Thank you. Are there any <coughs> questions from the committee? Any questions from Councillor Bacon? Um, I'm just wondering. Uh, thanks for coming down. Are you currently qualified as a national service officer? I think you are, right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So currently, we, we've gone above and beyond what our position descriptions call for. So at no point am I uh, obligated to, to do that. I do that because we want to provide a good service in our office. I'm trying to set up the office. So regardless of whether I'm here or not, or who has this position, we always have at least one national service officer uh, in the office. Right now, we have Alfredo Melendez, who's a national service officer again, but he's also knocking on the door of retirement. So we want to make sure that there's always someone there doing the job. And one more question, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Reagan. Through, through the chair. So who would be doing the office work because usually you've had office support? Correct. Well, the National Service Officer does have some side duties to help out with the office in the absence <laughs> of, of, a, of an investigator. Um, but between the investigator and a National Service Officer in the long run, they would both cover Chapter 115 tasks and um, the National Service Officer tasks, and that would continue with the director stuff. Thank you. If the chair could ask uh, permission to uh, speak to the mayor. Sure. Never yeah. mind, the mayor. Yes, Mayor Garcia. <laughs> all those in favor? Any Aye. opposed? Mayor, welcome. And, and we always appreciate your, your presence in the uh, any of our meetings, but especially finance. Um, mayor, the, um, you obviously looks like you signed off on the transfer, and I, I'm sure you understand the questions that we asked this evening. Will you be supporting both positions for the next fiscal year? That is, that's a good question. And so, um, Jesus and I haven't got, sat down and combed through his budget um, thoroughly. Uh, and that was uh, a, a matter that him and I haven't come to a conclusion yet. Okay. Uh, the reason I ask is we are, right. with unemployment, we are self-insured. And if both positions were to be filled this year, and come the fiscal year for whatever reason um, you decided not to fill both positions or to uh, leave one vacant is, is fine. But to lay one person off would then create an unemployment insurance uh, expense for the city. So I just wanted to make sure we were clear where we were going. So I think the, the proposal on the table is to move funds from a line item that's not currently occupied. Correct. Right? Yeah. But there's still money in that line item, which the direct the Mr. Prior could fill that position before the end of the year, with the with the money left in that line item. If I understood what I was told, it's. I mean, <clears throat> in perfect times with with good budgets, there there are two important positions. I think yeah. between now and, and June 30, and, and Jesus, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think there's an intent to what's the the funds that we're moving what what's the name of the account again the pay investigator is the vacated one now the investigator being transferred into the national service officer right so i don't think there is an intent to fill that role between now and june 30. the pay investigator right jesus i think that was our discussion right gonna, yeah, yeah it's unlikely that it would happen anyway even if we tried right so <clears throat> the Opportunity in front of us is to move funds from the investigator role into the national service officer role without the interest between now and June 30 to fill that role. If whether or not we're going to fund for that position in fiscal year 23, that is the conversation we haven't had yet and come to a conclusion. Thank you. Yes, sir. And I think our auditor just wanted to weigh in. Tanya Jojek is with us. Tanya, did you have your hand up for this? Yes, my hand was up. I just wanted to say that there will be no funding left in the investigator position for them to hire anybody with, because that balance thought. will be zero if this is processed. Thank you. That's what I thought, yeah. Thank you. Any further discussion? No. I make a motion to be approved. Motion no, second. Second, second that yeah. the transfer be approved. Is there any further discussion? Just one caveat, Mr. Uh, just, for for Jordan. just for housekeeping, <coughs> approving item two, giving leave to withdraw to item one on my motion. No, second that. If, if we could um, just deny. the wording on item one just be returned to auditor. That's right. It's yeah. a, or should we just say denied? We could deny it. It was one way to do it. Or we've been doing return, return to, to auditor, auditor, yeah. auditor just to avoid the roll call vote. A little time saving at the full city council meeting. Uh, whatever you prefer. Okay. Return to auditor. Right. No, second that. Second. Motion made second item number one. We return that to auditor. It's being replaced by item number two. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item number two, the motion is to adopt, refer to the city council. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Thank you. Hey, Zeus. Thank you, Mayor. Hey, Zeus, uh, item number three. 
Make a motion to take it off the table. Second. Second. Order to accept the recent in-kind gift from the SECO in Veteran Services, if I'm saying it correctly. The office of one pallet of various game puzzles valued at $2,821.50. Motion to take off the table. All those in favor? And Aye. Opposed? Sounds like a, a very generous uh, donation to, uh, to your department. Hey, Zeus, could you just tell us what this is? And Sure, it's very simple. Uh, the company SECO is looking to donate. Uh, it is a pallet of, of uh, puzzles and games. Um, they're all still boxed. There's about 300 games or so in this pallet. Uh, but they're looking for a, a, an in-kind uh, donation receipt signed by the city, which is, you know, uh, making sure that one, we can accept the donation and that we can make sure we can sign off the uh, in-kind receipt. Thank you. And I know someone's doing their homework because the city council has to uh, approve all gifts given to the city of uh, Hoyoke. Uh, usually it's very well heard and very well, well received by the city council. Is there any discussion? No, make a motion to be approved. Second. Second. Motion, second to be approved. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thanks, Jesus. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay. Motion to take item number four off the table. Second. Motion made a second to take item number four. We're moving to the uh, what's known as the police department uh, part of our agenda this evening. Item number four is under Mass General Law, section 4453A. The city accepts the fiscal 2021 Patrick Leahy Bulletproof Vest Partnership, $42,000, a $21,000 match grant and authorizes the establishment of a fund and or other method appropriate for the accounting of receipts and expenditures of all resources associated with the administration of said grant. Off the table, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, so move. Chief, Lieutenant Hart, Mayor, welcome. Um, Who would like to walk us through this? Um, I'd, re I'd defer to S S Lieutenant Hart. He's got all the facts. We, we call him the Grant Master. He is the Grant Master. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Hart, welcome. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, yes, this is a uh, $42,000 grant, um, which requires the uh, city a half match of uh, 21000 um, And this is for our bulletproof vests and each vest is approximately $1,200 or $1,200 and um, we'd be uh, outfitting approximately 35 officers and these are the Molly vests that are with the outer carriers and have the, um, the standard attachments for the uh, um, pistol magazines, the um, handcuff holders and flashlight holders I believe. Twelve hundred apiece. Yes. Okay, and there's thirty, John. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. And the match will be coming from. Um, I believe it's coming from the uh, buyback. Um, I'm not sure which. Yeah. I think buyback. I think there's a transfer. Of the on the transfer. It's yeah. in the transfer. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Chief, on that transfer, where's the twenty-one thousand? It's later on the agenda. It's coming out of. The multi-transfer personal equipment, correct? Correct. That's where it's going to. That's where correct. it's going to. Correct. The transfer later is going to personal equipment. Okay, so equipment it's coming out of from personal a, equipment. a combination of sick buyback, time old, and vacation buyback that looks like you're not going to use this year. Correct. Okay. Okay, that's item number seven on the agenda to the members of the committee. Sure. Uh, we will be going over that. If we, anybody have any questions on that now? Um, I have a question on the uh, vest grant, if you're ready. Councilor Jordan. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> John, so we're looking to, with this, to get 35 new vests. Question, at this stage of the game, like, why do we need, I mean, we don't have enough bulletproof vests at this stage of the game. I mean, when no. people retire, they turn in their equipment. That's not like a souvenir they get to keep, right? So That's correct. So my question is, like, at this stage of the game, it seems like invariably we've been buying guns, bulletproof vests, all this gear for, for I don't know how many years, decades. Like, it seems like we'd have rooms full of this stuff at this point, you know? So, like, what, why do we need these? Yeah, well, um, because uh, the, the manufacturer has a five-year life um, for each vest. 
So after that five years, um, they won't warranty that vest at all. And just through the wear and tear and the sweating and the summer um, months, it really wears down that material. And like you said, we do have stockpiles of those and we do keep those uh, on hand, those that, that are still, um, still have life with them and we give those to like the reserves or the auxiliaries who, who do temporary work or go to the academy where we can't afford to really purchase new vests on the spot. Okay. There's also an issue of fitting. You know, all the vests now, it, it's not like one size fits all. They're all different. <clears throat> They're all measured to your size. And you know, my vest isn't gonna fit, you know, uh, you know another officer who's much smaller. So those all have to be, you know, fitted to the officer. And then we can kind of match them up, you know, if there's another six foot three guy who looks like me, they're rare, but if there is, <laughs> then, you know, we can pass mine on to them. And that's what John's talking about. Perhaps an auxiliary, perhaps a reserve, we'll, we'll do that. Um, okay. They don't come, so, like, you're saying they're custom to each person? They don't come like... <clears throat> Small, medium, large, extra large? No, they get, um, everyone gets fitted um, through, we're purchasing them through Sentry. So Sentry actually has a person come to the station and fit each individual. Mm -hmm. So um, who, how do you decide? You have everybody, the whole department on a five-year rotation? Is that it? Like yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. And how many, how many people are wearing bulletproof vests every day at this point? Um, I'm hoping everyone. Okay. Yes. Is it like how many people is? Because I'm thinking five times 35 is, uh, I believe it's at 175. Yeah, I believe we have 117. Uh, sworn, 117? Yeah, sworn full time. Um, not, not including reserves or, you know, the specials now, but. So we try to have extras? Is that it? it? Sounds just numerically, it doesn't quite add up to me. Thinking. 35, you're buying 35 a year, or is this just a sort of an unusual year that you're buying extra? Um, that, that number varies. So, we'll, like next year, like we're in the process <coughs> now um, because I, we were talking about maybe putting a, a line item in the, in the new budget for bulletproof vests just to get that number. So, it's not always going to be 35. Next year, it might be 10. Okay. It might be 10, 10 officers who need new vests. Okay. Next year, it might be 40. So, it. Okay. it we have a, a running list, and as each officer retires, then we kind of fill in from there. And, and we can't really, um, through the buyback and, and reimbursements, you can't um, put in for like an officer like this year and then put in for that same officer in three years because they have a, a running record of that, so it has to be after five years. Right, which makes sense, yeah. Um, I can see why they have that for a rule. If, if mm -hmm. the thing's good for five years, they want to make sure it's good for five years. Right, right. and you don't so. keep trying to get reimbursed. I, I think to answer your question, I think the last time we were here on this grant was two years ago. Two years ago. Right, right. correct. So it, it isn't necessarily every year. Okay. Um, and then it kind of goes by, as those numbers come into us and we know and we're tracking, and we see, okay, now we have a need, we'll apply for the grant and try to fill that void. Okay. If we have a year, like perhaps last year, that was an off year, we didn't have a lot, we were able to get by with what we had, move some vests around, okay. and then knowing we'd come into this year with a bigger purchase. Okay, all right, thank you. Any further <coughs> discussion? Lieutenant, did you say five years warranty? <coughs> Because I'm on my third vest as a probation officer, and I've been getting one every seven years. So those extra two years, I got to be careful. I, I would check on the inside of the carrier. It, it either gives you an expiration date or a manufacturing date. If it gives you the manufacturing, just add five years, and that's one of the okay. And to Councilor Jardine's question about being fitted, I was fitted three times for my last vest, and they still couldn't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that one, Chief. Are you 6'3"? <laughs> I'm six four and a half. Okay. <laughs> Do you have an extra one? I might have one for you. <laughs> if you ever need one, call me. I think ours are better. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the grant. Yes, motion and second to adopt, refer, re recommend the uh, approval to the full city council tomorrow night. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So Aye. Aye. Item number four. I should take item number 
Three, or a five. Three. A five. Five off the table. Second. Motion made and second to take item five off the table. A grant, chapter 44, section 53A, the city by accepts the provisions. It's the fiscal 2022 Senator Charles Shannon Jr. Community Safety Initiative. Uh, this is an annual grant. This year is $556,355.26. There is no match. We would have, we were, uh, approval would be also authorizing the establishment of fund and or other method appropriate for the accounting of receipts and expenditures. A motion to take off the table. All those in favor? Any Aye. opposed? Uh, I take it, Lieutenant Hart. Yes. So um, this is our annual um, Shannon grant we get um, every year. Um, each year, it varies on on the amount that the state uh, allocates. Sometimes it's down. Sometimes it's up. Um, this year, it seems to be um, up from last year. Although last year they did do an amendment and they increased it a little. So this is the actual amount um, for this year. And um, I can give you the breakdown of it. Um, so for first, it's um, for the Hoyle Police Department will receive approximately 161,976. Um, Mass Hire will get approximately 88,773. Um, Opportunity Academy with the uh, Hoyle Public Schools will be receiving 4,000. Um, the Hoyle Boys and Girls Club, 153,966. Um, the Hamden County Sheriff's Department, 24,474. The Chickabee Boys and Girls Club, 81,286. Hoyle High School, 23,800 and Hoyle Community College 28,078. And again, this is a, uh, a gang prevention um, grant that um, supports our youth from ages 10 to 24. John, what was the Hoyle High School amount? Hoyle High School was 23,800. Thank you. And I did send uh, all the counselors um, 2020 um, summary summary report of the uh, the Shannon grant. Um, 2021 is currently being worked on by the state, and once that comes, I'll forward that to um, you and the mayor as well. Okay. The uh, <clears throat> 2021 did it balance out at the end of the fiscal year? Yes, I don't. I'm think sorry. The 2020. 2020? Yes. Tanya, are you with us? Yes. Is the Shannon Grant balance as of last year? I um, wasn't aware that it that it was closed out. If um, Lieutenant Hart, if you could send me a copy of that report, I can do a check for you. Okay, not a problem. Thank you. Any questions from the committee or any other counselors? Actually, I had a question to you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> when, you, when you say things like check out, and I'm glad you look into that, are we saying that when it's represented <coughs> to us as an account receivable, essentially, that we're going to get the money and we book it, that we actually get the money? Is that what we're checking for? Because one of the questions that's been raised previously, and the police was on a list of them, is grants that we say we're getting we spend the money we pay officers and then we don't get all of the money and then the question is to what level of frequency is that happening and i know this was the subject of some review as part of the division of local services review <clears throat> on the on the um free cash certifications that they had identified a number of these grant programs where the money didn't materialize in full. So I wanted to make sure as we're looking at each of these grant programs, is there an accounting back to us and to the auditor and is everybody checking to make sure there's no surprises? Yes, so um, we, we've, since all those mishaps, uh, we've been in contact with, uh, with Tanya, we've created some new policies and, and procedures. Oh. Oh, oh. So we're pretty much talking and, and kind of getting reimbursed on a quarterly basis. 
this grant um, is different from, from other grants. Each grant is, is unique in and of itself. Okay. This grant here will get our first installment once the final report is completed from FY21. Okay. So, and then after that, once we do our second year expenditure report summary, um, we'll get the second and, and last installment in June or July, in July, so. Now, are you considered the administrator of the grant such that even funds that don't come to us, but for example, so much goes to Hoyokai, so much goes to HCC, so much to the Boys Club, you actually at the end of the year verify or contact those agencies to make sure that they did whatever they were supposed to do, that, and there's the receipts and all of this uh, for auditing purposes. Yes, yeah, so okay. we have the, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, they're the um, lead agency on this. So we have all the, the, the partners invoice um, to the Hoyoke Boys and Girls Club, and then they'll um, send those invoices to me where I check them and okay. then put them into a, a Excel spreadsheet to verify their amounts so they don't go over what they're budgeted for. And are these reviewed by our outside auditor annually? Is it, whether it's Mel, I don't know if it's still Melanson and Heath, that was who it was here when I left, but I don't know if that, they're still our outside auditor. Maybe Tanya knows. Tanya, who's our outside auditor today? It is still Melanson and Heath, and they do review the um, grant deficits at the end of each fiscal year. Okay, great, thank you. Tanya, uh, uh, Councilor Jardine's question and Lieutenant Hart's uh, answer is that we are balanced and that there is no deficit spending in any of these prior grants for the Shannon grant. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And I think Councilor Jardine's question is good, but I'll, I'll take it a step further. It's the, the overspending is also sometimes just an accounting error from what we've learned, where especially the annual grants that are posted wrong um, either at the department or perhaps at the treasurer's office or in the auditor's department when they come when they come back like from the school department is that correct that's correct and um, all the departments have been reconciling their grants they've been completing the um, the end of grant report sending it to my office and I just verify that everything checks out and the balance is zero thank you and that's why we call you the new sheriff in town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> Is there any further questions or discussion on this grant? No, I make a motion to be approved. Make second. Vote made and seconded to second. approve the grant to refer to the full city council tomorrow night. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Pass it is one. Five to zero. Item number six. Motion to take item number six off the table. Second. second. Motion made and seconded to take item six off the table. That there being hereby is appropriated by Transco fiscal year 2022. $205,000 from line items, Lieutenant 30,000, Patrol 105,000, Dispatcher 70,000, the total 205, two reserves 30,000, overtime 175 for a total of 205. On the motion to take off the table, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, so moved. Aye. Chief, Chief Pratt, would you? Yes. Okay, so this order, um, it, you know, we're back for the overtime. I've been trying to um, keep that at a set amount so that it can be tracked by the council as they requested. Um, the other added here is the money from Lieutenant to reserves. Um, back in the beginning of the fiscal year, when the reform bill thought we were taking reserves away from us, I had transferred money out of there to overtime in my first transfer, um, and, I, and I wish to put 30,000 back in there because now we do have reserves, um, you know, through our um, adopting specials in the reserve role. So um, I didn't put all the money back because we're further along in the year, obviously. And I think with that plus what we had left, um, we should, that'll, that'll help us. And I think it'll certainly help me control the overtime. The, uh, the rest of the money for overtime is from uh, patrol, which is from shortages, and from grant, um, extra money, and the other is from the uh, 911 dispatch, the 70,000 from there, for a total of 175. 
The um, the lieutenant, thirty thousand dollars. Is that a vacancy or partial vacancy? Uh, that was basically from grant funding. Reimbursed the salary. Correct. And which grant did the, the, the lieutenant? I'm sorry. Which grant? Which grant did you use for that? John, do you know? Uh, it's multiple grants that take yes, uh, multiple grants. I'm partial parts of a lieutenant's salary to manage. So those those add up. And the patrolmen, you said, were shortages being vacancies. You know, correct. And wh what's the 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 max for patrolmen? Is it ninety? Nine. Nine. Uh, well, the budget last year passed ninety-two. You funded ninety. Okay. How many do we have now? 86 currently one just recent retirement and a, a recent uh, departure for another career field and the dispatcher is reimbursement also I'm going by yeah that's memory. another grant funding okay and chief on the reserve you've been telling us your average per pay period as that what is that currently for overtime, I'm sorry, on the overtime. On the overtime. You've been telling us the average pay period. Uh, the average normally is around 38. We were down in the 35 range, and um, we're pretty, we're holding pretty steady there. And the reasons before, gonna... because we have a lot of new city councilors, you were at the beginning of the year telling us that the partly because of the reform bill, at one period of time of this fiscal year, you couldn't use reserve officers to replace officers. You have a shortage of officers being down to 86 and a couple of other things. So yeah, I can elaborate on that. So um, <clears throat> it, it was sort of the perfect storm. The reform bill hit us. They stripped us of the ability to use reserve officers, um, only the ones we currently had. The ones we also currently had were also on their way to the police academy in October. We sent 10 officers to the police academy. So on top of not having reserves, we lost 10 officers to the academy. So from that 86 number, 10 of them are, went to the police academy. So um, without that backfill, I was forced to move other officers from uh, detective bureaus downstairs to cover the cars. So if we are currently, and why I need the money for the reserves is I am training the new res the specials, the reserve officers to um, come up to a level where they're going to be allowed to backfill for us and save us money as well. So um, it's kind of unprecedented times with the reform bill. It's, it's changed a lot of things that where we would normally have had reserve officers to help us through this time. We didn't have that and we had to do some shuffling and um, we're, we're getting there. I think we won't have to do this again where we had to move officers from the bureaus down to cover cars. Um, once we get these reserves up and trained, um, the specials reserves up and trained, and then, th then we will have them as backfill. Um, we currently have, well, as of tomorrow, we'll have 22 reserve uh, special officers. So that will certainly help us. Of that, uh, about 10 of them are in training to be um, brought up to the level where they can work full time for us. Well, full-time positions. positions. They can backfill the full-time positions. So if I can get, um, j just add one thing on the, um, on the overtime. Like, like the chief said, um, we are around 35,000 uh, per pay period. Um, going back, uh, the five-year average was around 42,000. Um, and if you look at it, the five-year average for overtime was one, one million nine thousand no ninety five thousand nine hundred thirty nine dollars that's the um uh five-year average right now with, with the way we're going at the 35 we're looking at um approximately uh nine hundred and twelve thousand six hundred fourteen that we hopefully project with this 35 number so if you look at it <coughs> That's a, a difference of over $183,000 that we've been mm -hmm. 
decreasing that overtime year after year right. after year. Also, too, in that, it, you know, you have to factor in that we've had raises as well. Mm -hmm. That never seems to get factored into the equation. I, I, I wish I was a little smarter with math and could figure that part out, but um, it, it's, it's a factor. You know, raises come in, and yet we're still bringing that number down. I think we're headed in the right direction. We're making some structural changes to um, help us in that manner. And I think, like John said, I, I, you know, this, this transfer of overtime will, will bring us to about, um, this is our third transfer, and I'm probably certainly going to come back for one last one, hopefully the last one. But I can never predict what's going to happen, as you know. So, uh, but I'm but I'm pretty confident that we're going to come in with another decrease in the overtime from last year, and and my goal is to continue that. So I, I think we're headed in the right direction. I think we're doing all the right things and trying to uh, manage it. And you know, quite frankly, we were really up against it at first when the reform bill came in because I was my initial thought right away was to the parade and road race and how we would handle that without auxiliary officers or, or reserve officers. Mm -hmm. We've since worked our way back. We have now special officers to replace the reserve officers and the auxiliary traffic division, which we have started. Civilian traffic officers are gonna be able to help us as well. So I think we've climbed that mountain. I've taken a deep breath over the last couple of weeks and knowing that we're ready for the parade and road race. And, and I think we're, we're headed in the right direction with overtime. And um, I think the only, I, for me, the, the one, you know, just getting used to the new system of coming before you has been a little bit of a challenge because I, I, you know, I really need to forecast way out and make sure, and I know we hit one time, we hit an election, which caused a delay. So I have to prepare those into my calculation. So I'm trying to do that and be consistent with what I come back for. So it's easy for you to see what I have left, what I'm going for. And it, it, I guess smaller numbers are easier to work with than bigger numbers is the way I look at it. So that's my plan going forward, and I'm going to continue that. Thank you. Councilor Dalton. Yeah, thanks, Chief, for, for bringing that forward. On, on your, um, your special officers, you said you had 10 in training. What is the time frame for them to be ready? After, yep, on the list. Approximately. It, it's, it's different for each one, but I, I would say within the next... Um, <coughs> well, it's a it's a three-year process uh, the new Academy the new training for these officers is what they call the bridge Academy they have to complete uh, an, a certain amount online they have to do three one-week classes at the Academy that will certify them and then they do a, need to do a certain amount of hours which will take years for them to do and then um, but for us internally we do our own training to get them ready to work for us in the capacities some of it is just in-house training being able to be um, you know the, the, the officer inside being able to transport prisoners being able to step in and eventually they get to the level where we actually use them in the same capacity as a full-time officer so it's gonna be different for all of them based on where they are and unfortunately that system is set up by the alphabet so <laughs> we have to kind of follow along with that that's part of the reform bill I had nothing to do with that just for the record um, so uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna continue to get that done and get these guys trained up I, I would say certainly by summertime we, we plan to have them ready to go so we're gonna be able to utilize them pretty su sufficiently by summer by summertime and, and on the uh, this with the overtime money the 175 what what will that take you to how far will that go uh, like how many pay periods or how many months? Had to give me a math problem. All right, uh, you uh, said you're good at math, so, so I'm trying to figure. Uh, <laughs> you know, well, I'm trying to. Uh, think bye, bye, with sir. that, bye, bye. with what we have left, we're in a payroll this week. Um, yeah. I got a pencil. That's how I learned math. And uh, 40, so about 215. Divide that by four. But about five, about five, five, four or five pay, more pay periods, and then I'll I'll work it out in the system. To I like to I like to have about two or three pay periods in the bank Thanks. when I come back to you, so that in case there's an issue, um, you know, we're scheduling wise or or getting it into the council or you have questions and you need to take more time to make that decision, 
that we have some flexibility so that we're not sitting there on our last penny in front of you hoping that you you know pass these uh, yeah and, and i know i understand it's a timing thing too and, I, and yeah. I, you know as as us as you know the the finance council with our colleagues got to make sure that you know the money is you know there and but we got to make sure the money's spent you know properly and wisely because it's it's taxpayer dollars here um that, real real briefly on and just go over the civilian traffic officers you said yeah coming is that correct something new and do they get paid that's, no that's it's basically um the best way i can describe it is it's the former auxiliary police officers who are now no longer um have that designation but many many towns and communities have gone to a civilian traffic force right. to assist them with uh, primarily traffic duties, and they do not fall under the police. The reason we could not keep the auxiliary police, because under the new reform mm -hmm. bill, they did not allow for that type of officer without the level of, basically the state said, everybody's got to be at the same level. And auxiliaries were nowhere even close to, to that level to be able to be utilized. So we had to disband it temporarily, always, um, you know, with the hope that somehow that that would get addressed through the through the law, or you know, through the legislature, legislature. Would make a correction. They haven't done that, um, but we moved forward, um, brought them back as civilian traffic officers, and um, there, you know, I got about there were 70 auxiliary officers before the reform bill hit. You know, for lack of a better way of saying it, I scooped up 10 of them to be specials, and I got about 55 of the originals back. Um, so we're, we're moving forward with that. It's going to, it's a lifesaver for us for the parade and road race. And I mean, that is their primary duty uh, anyway. So um, you, you won't notice a big change um, other than in name and appearance, and they're, you know, as far as exactly what they do, they're focused specifically on traffic duties. Okay. And yeah. that is allowed through the, the law. So that's, okay. that's where we headed with them. All right, I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Councilor Jardine. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Chief, in terms of how grants mm -hmm. harmonize with the budget from a projection perspective, how do you account for here, for example, one of the things you, you stated, well, you know, we have a surplus in lieutenant because 30,000 of it's covered by grant. 70,000 of our 911 yeah. dispatchers are covered by grants. When you're preparing your budget, and I think this upcoming one, in fairness to you, will be your first, I believe, because I think it was the former chief that did the last budget, if I'm, or the current fiscal year. Right. But as you're looking at this and saying, you know, conservatively, mind you, do you look at it and say, okay, I've had enough to cover two of my E911 dispatchers over the last five years in grant funding, and therefore I won't request as much in my budget so that we don't have these type of surpluses. And um, because, you know, every dollar counts and well it would be nice not to run surpluses of the, you know, E911 to be over by 70,000. That's kind of a lot. Cause those positions pay what, maybe like 40, 45,000 a year. That's like almost two full positions. I think the, 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 the issue with that, and I know John can speak to it probably better than me if I don't get it right, but the PSAP grant is a reimbursable grant. We can't count on it. So when I'm budgeting, I can't know exactly what they're gonna give us until they give it to us. Okay. So, correct, yeah. and, and so I've heard him give me that spiel many times. So I know that. Um, I, I guess I would say the way I look at the grants, mm -hmm. um, whether it's right or wrong, and I would ask the same question to you. Would you then look at the overtime that is presented to me in the beginning of the fiscal year? If you were going to increase that, then I wouldn't have to rely on the grant money to, to move that into overtime. So. I look at it, I know how it works, and it's a, it's a you know, constant juggle, but I know what I need. Mm -hmm. um, and so those, I can't really look at those all the time and say 100% the grant will be there for me. Um, and, and so it, as far as that PSAP grant and the dispatcher you're talking about, that one um, that we utilize is a support incentive grant. So that does cover salaries over time. 
but also a big portion of that is to help fund and maintain a dispatch center in and of itself to Correct. include our CAD systems that go in our cruisers. So really any time during the year, if we find that there is a major problem, major cost, we can't come to the city and, and try and do it. Well, we could, but, but we have that um, flexibility to do a, a grant adjustment and ask the state to um, revise the grant and amend it so that we can cover those, those costs for equipment. Um, mm -hmm. in those times. Another issue to consider with those grants is the actual date that the grant itself is signed and that's the effective date. Sometimes this PSAP grant wasn't signed in, in, until like October. So now we can't go back and get reimbursed from July to October. So sometimes we're really stretching it to try and really get all of that reimbursement. Sometimes mm -hmm. we're not able to get that reimbursement so mm -hmm. there's a lot of different factors there's a lot of factors and and, and every grant's different you know mm -hmm. um, there's other grants that john can attest to that we we're not allowed to you know um i'll, I'll use the dirty word supplant mm -hmm. um so we have to be careful of that and um i, I think that grants are uh for lack of a better way of saying it is how we get it done i mean we do a lot of things with grants, a lot of extra things. Mm -hmm. All the work we're doing down at Ray Street is all, you know, pretty much grant funded and, no, I, um, I, I, and no, important stuff. Sorry, so okay. with that comes the grants and then we move the money to cover those positions. So and, and counselor to your point, I, I see what you're saying and trying to um, like use those grant positions to offset the, the total amount for our annual hmm. budget. Um, but again, you, you get those those salaries and we run short and if you don't fund the overtime portion of it but you take away from those those salary positions now from from years past we haven't been getting um, free cash well so I was calling there yeah, yeah that's gonna be one of my comments and that's and we mind. haven't been and, back for extra money yeah, and, and, and and then we we've, we've heard from the outside auditor and, and finance that that's kind of a bad practice to use budget salary items to go back and, and get paid out of free cash for, for that so well my, my thinking issues. I appreciate the answer I guess my thinking on it is again if we had some liquidity which we don't have when we get the, to that point hopefully we can restore free cash it would be ideal to budget what we reasonably think will be spent and budget at that amount and if we get grants either the grant money would then not go back into the police department budget, but it would be transferred into directly into the general fund, okay? Because you're already appropriated. One of the things from an accounting perspective, in my opinion, would be that if we fully fund the items, then any of the grant money that's supplementing those positions or reimbursing us for those positions should not go into the police department directly it should go back into the general fund right because we've already budgeted the full salary i would say yes but it, i would say that as long as you were going to fund the when you say the line items are properly funded then the overtime would be part of that equation well no because that's a separate issue uh the reason you're underfunded on your overtime line is because the city council and the mayor have historically wanted to take give it to you in sections Correct. so that you're justifying why you need the overtime. The general perception has been if you're spending a million dollars a year, they don't want to just hand you a million dollars and say, oh my God, it's seven months into the year and I already spent the million, right? We want to give it out in chunks of 250 at a pop or whatever the case may be. Right. So that you're coming back and adjusting. So overtime is a special case because that's the question that opens up a lot of different questions. Right. It goes to why is there so much overtime? Right. How many vacancies do you have? You know, the goal is to have all the positions filled. And as a result, you wouldn't need overtime. Is there special things going on? You know, um, of course. I think I think that's the logic behind why the overtime in the ideal world, you're right. right. I mean, we would just fund it, you would spend it, you would never come back, 
end of story. That would be great. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> the problem is people before you uh, have you. spent, uh, you know, have spent either too much or moved things around or whatnot. So there's been, it's been like an extra check in place, if you will. I totally understand you know? that. So I that, guess my question would be in that scenario you're talking about, when I come back, where are we getting the money from? So that's a great question. The answer, <laughs> the answer is when we have liquidity and we back to free cash again, the answer would be those transfers should be coming from free cash into the overtime line so that the money that is grant funding is going into the general fund and if we had certified free cash, we would be able to take it from free cash and give it to you in chunks for your overtime. The problem is we don't have liquidity and therefore we have to overfund these line items and allow you to move it around because in or if without liquidity and free cash, the money, if we don't appropriate it, we're not allowed to charge it on the levy. How'd you get that? And so we wouldn't be able to put it out to, the, to tax the public um, if we didn't have it as appropriated dollars. Correct. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, to, to your point too, as well, like you said, once we have that liquidity, you have to keep in mind that starting a new um, budget in July and putting those salaries, the grant salaries into the general fund, those, those salaries wouldn't be available till the following year. Because you can't use general fund money in that fiscal year. You have to wait for the end of that fiscal year to use those salaries. I don't understand. So if in July mm -hmm. you're trying to say you want to have those grant salaries used and put in the general fund. Well, mm -hmm. if you're putting a general fund in, let's uh -huh. say, FY22, mm -hmm. you can't use those funds until FY23. That's right. Yeah, because it, it, those, those dollars will be going, they will go into our free cash certification for the following year. But right. again, once we create liquidity, this thing will get on a rotation that, you know, last year's grant money becomes next year's free cash and then that year. And we'll always right. have a trickle effect uh, of that, but you'll... I guess it's that first step that's the tough one. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. And, so let's, and, it'll be interesting to see what we get for free cash certification, you know, for this, you know, that we're going to be able to spend for fiscal year, what's at 23. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. But I can see why you're doing it this way now, because there is no other pot. You have to slide the deck chairs around. But Correct. in the future, I think the better approach would be fully fund the positions and send the grants into the general fund. That would be the most transparent way, in my opinion, to account for it, one man's opinion. So anyways, but this, this seems justified, Mr. Chairman. I would. We, we do have uh, two, I think, fairly important people that want to weigh in on this. Okay. Uh, one trumps the other one. Before I recognize the auditor, I'd just like to recognize Mayor Garcia. I think uh, the auditor is probably going to describe what I'm about to say, and I think, uh, in a nutshell, I'm giving you the credit. So <laughs> <laughs> I think what Councillor Jodane is explaining does sound uh, nice, and yet the most transparent way. I just think in the world of municipal finance, it just doesn't work that way. Um, the question I had, I don't. You had mentioned something about funds unused being transferred into the general fund. No, the grant funds, as they're come in, as we receive payment from the funding source, those money should be paid into the general fund. So I don't think we don't, and Tanya can probably correct me, I don't think we can pay into the general fund. I think what happens, unused monies later becomes certified by the Department of Revenue, as you already know, mm -hmm. uh, certified into free cash. So I don't think we can pay it into the general fund. It just kind of sits there. We don't touch it and let it just get certified later into free cash where you'll see it. The other thing too is, and you know, if I think Sergeant already alluded to this, it's not, it's frowned upon using free cash for, to fund general operating. But again, I think, you know, there's, there might be ways we can work together and try to figure out some sort of policy and procedure to try to satisfy, because municipal finance, as you already know, you've been, you guys have been around much longer than I have. It's a moving target constantly. I know. And what we want to do is be sure that we're somehow trying to hit that target. And it sounds like the department has been trying, um, and we're getting closer to it. Uh, but how we manage as far as 
closing this gap that you're identifying here, uh, Counselor. Yeah, I think there's a way we can make it work so that we make sure that we're, you know, achieving those efficiencies we're looking to, but also trying to be as transparent and clear and, and uh, to the penny as, as possible when it comes to, you know, how we spend the budget we put together and so forth. So, but it, there's some things that I'm with you, like it, it makes sense in, in my mind, but in municipal finance, it doesn't, it doesn't work that well, way. Well, Mary, here, let's look at it from this perspective. They're saying that they have a grant. Mm -hmm. The grant is paying a portion of these salaries. Right. They're paying it out of the grant source and not paying it out of the salary line item. Right. That's where my point is that should not happen that way. But and right. if I, I think the better approach is we pay all the salary from the salary line and then the revenue that comes in from the grant source be paid to the city, period. What it appears that's going on and why there's these surpluses running is they're not paying all the money from the salary lines. They're doing it so much from salary, so much from the grants. So your point is well taken. What I'm saying is, is what happens when, so when we're putting our budget together, like the chief alluded to earlier, or the or sergeant, you can't, it's tough to tell because you don't know whether or not you're going to get the grant. So it's hard to just rely solely on, so we budget for it. And when it is available, they tap into that as an alternative funding source. And to your mm -hmm. point, you see that surplus growing. Mm -hmm. And so whether if it's the, the grant or appropriation, that surplus still gets transferred over to the free cash granted if it doesn't get touched and transferred over to fund anything else. The other thing too is I don't think so to when we get these grants, you're saying let's let that go transfer over into the general fund and solely solely spend appropriation. Mm -hmm. I don't think the the grantors I don't, it don't I don't think it works that way. I, Tanya can probably explain better. It's not that I'm trying to I, I, I see the, the the reasoning behind your approach. I don't think municipal operates that way, but again, I think that there's a way that we can work together to make sure that we're getting as tight as we can possible, and mm -hmm. as possible when it, transparent as possible when it comes to how we spend this money. Um, the other thing about free cash, I just wanted to address one comment, which is that free cash is not, shouldn't be used for funding the general operations of the budget. I, I disagree with that, and here's why. True on the stabilization fund, that should not be used for general operating expenses. I think the expectation is always that free cash will be used for appropriations of the following fiscal year because it's unspent money, budget m money that was budgeted from sure. the prior year. So the expectation is that in the next fiscal year, you would use it for whatever, you know. Now the question, your, your point is well taken if you're saying, why are we running huge free cash if one, either we're taxing too much at some point, if it gets really, really big, we don't, um, we haven't had the problem with typically too, too much free cash. In the, bat, in the old days, we used to. We used to have huge certifications, six and seven million a year. Mm. Uh, but nice. um, yeah, the good old days. <laughs> um, but uh, today, we're lucky if we get two. That's considered a good sure. year for us. Um, but those funds, your point is, I agree, is if we were budgeting appropriately, either we're budgeting too much in some of these things and these departments are turning back big monies. So the question is, why are we overfunding some of these departments? If you have a department that's turning back a million dollars a year, and I know some of them brag at the end, you know, hey, I turned back a million last year and you know, this is great. And I did it the year before and a year before and a year before. At some point, somebody has to say, well, when did the executive begin to tone down the amount going yeah, in? Right. That, starts to wean you off of that. Like, that's not really budgeting. It's like I throw a big chunk of cash at you, you don't spend it all, and then you turn some about, you know, it, at some point you gotta get that a little more accurate. So on the, on the free cash front, um, it's not a, a rule that Josh Garcia made up. It's, uh, it's a best practice identified through Department of yeah. Revenue as well as our auditors. Mm -hmm. When you look, take free cash and you spend it to fund general operating, it's right, 
ideally they they want to suspend on those large one-time capital related expenses okay um, for planning purposes we want to use free cash specifically for that and that sp so that we defray the what's the word i'm looking for the the dependency to uh to fund uh operating free cash because one day like today or the last couple of years i should say free cash becomes unavailable and then we get right hit with that so it, it's not can we do it yeah we'll have we have the power to do it it's not it's it's often a frowned upon practice right um the other what was the other thing you mentioned there about uh the last comment you made oh the budget million dollars you're right if 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 a department is turning over a million dollars if it's for this reason specifically because they happen to defray you'll never turn <laughs> Because they're defraying they expenses using grants, you know those. You know what I mean? Like, but if if a department is is uh, putting their budget together a million dollars over than what they need, and they're not showing or proving any reason why or how, you know what I mean? Then that would that wouldn't be anything I'd ever support as mayor to fund. Um, but things like this do happen. You get a grant. It was un, you know. You, you you redirect. I'm I'm actually very grateful that they're they're um, defraying costs using grant resources as it becomes available because yeah, the funding that frees up, they can keep within their department to cover the other uh, other things that go on like overtime or whatever the case the 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 vests or or whatever project they come around. But to your point. Counselor, yeah, absolutely. I'm only questioning the accounting. I'm, I'm not questioning this. It, right. No, this is great. They're using yeah, yeah. grants to offset costs. It's wonderful. I'm only saying how the housekeeping of it is. Yeah, that, that, that's I, my like, only point. Tanya probably can speak better yeah. than I can. It's just, yeah. in, in my mind, it's just that's not working. But I think, you know, obviously there's a way we can work together mm -hmm. and figure something out. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. I, I think, regardless, you know, the fact that we do get grants is very important because mm -hmm. it supplements the. <laughs> Free, for, it supplements the dollars that we need for the, all the operating costs right. of the city. When we look at one department, we're looking at one department tonight. When we talk to the mayor and we ask questions, we're looking at the whole budget. And that doesn't always happen in a timely fashion at this time of year, although it usually does when the mayor is putting the budget together. Reimbursements, you know, if, if I was a state giving out millions of dollars, I'd do a, re, a, do a reimbursement grant because it makes the city show they're spending the money where it was supposed to be spent. That's right. And the dilemma it causes, and I'm gonna turn it over to Tanya, she can tell me if I'm right, wrong, or somewhere in the middle, is Mass General Law and Finance, a, a budget is a 12-month budget. It's easy to say that the chief salary is X, we have to put X in that line item before you get one paycheck. 88 patrol officers is X, we have to put X to fund the X amount of patrol officers you have to show 12 months. We can't go as we, as we like. As Councilor Jadane pointed out, with overtime, it's unpredictable. We can say, hey, when we have it, we'll transfer it in. When we don't have it, cut the overtime for the rest of the year. You know, hopefully that doesn't happen when there's a, well, there's always a real need chief, but hopefully that doesn't happen when there's a, a very uh, strategic need and in, in things that are going on. So it, it's a dilemma, you know, and, and at budget time, that's why we like to know what's going on in the middle of the year, because when the budget comes, we ask the questions. And it's, there was five years ago, seven years ago, you know, we didn't see all this money being transferred. It just happened during the year, and we had to pick it up at the end of the year to look at it. So now that I put myself out in the limb, Tanya, you still got that hand up? I, um, I do, actually. You, you covered what I wanted to say was that Mass General Law requires that you appropriate for all of your positions in full. You cannot supplant your, your general fund budget with grant funding, which is totally different than in the private and nonprofit world. It would be totally fine. And it would be good budgeting if you could do that, but unfortunately, the law doesn't allow you to because, as the Chief said, you're not always guaranteed to get those grants and you don't want to put those positions at risk. And the other <clears throat> dilemma, Mayor, is, and I think you start to see it, is it's been, since prior to Mike Sullivan sitting in uh, room one, 
which I'm thinking is now close to 20 years, of where we have not seen one dollar for capital outlay request in a budget in the beginning of a fiscal year. And that's where we've been, you know, looking at free cash and other grants to supplement, cap, you know, what capital outlay needs we have. And that's, uh, that's tough when the city council is looking at a budget because we, we see the salaries that you need to operate the city, but we don't see the full budget because yep. there yep. really are needs out there. And that's why we asked in the, uh, I think it's a five-year capital outlay plan was implemented. I think Tanya still kind of keeps track of that, but... We would appreciate that you know you came to the forefront again when the budget is before us this year or next year's budget is before us in june thank you tanya You're welcome joe thanks joe <laughs> can i um, make a motion councillor Thomas, motion make a motion to approve the transfer of two hundred five thousand. Second. second motion made a second to adopt the transfer i recommend the full city council tomorrow night all those in favor uh, aye. aye opposed so moved aye Motion to take item number seven off the table. Motion and second to take item seven off the table. This is a transfer request. It's uh, items from $100,000 sick, sick, buy, sick buyback, $45,000 time owed, vacation buyback $40,500. The total is $185,500. Two, personal equipment $21,000, supplies ammo $14,500, data maintenance $36,000, uh, repair and maintenance motor vehicles twenty thousand. Education training thirty thousand. Motor vehicle supplies fourteen. Motor vehicle fuel thirty thousand. Office supplies twenty thousand, which totals the one eighty five five hundred. Off the table. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mm -hmm. um, Chief Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Hart, Mayor. Um, we heard the uh, twenty one thousand going into is that match for the vest? Correct. But can you tell us quickly why there's surpluses in Sick by back time, old and vacation. Okay, so that's money that was appropriated for uh, potential retirements that are now not retiring. So that's extra money there. Um, the line items they're going to, personal equipment we mentioned about the vest. The 14,500 is for ammo. The, as you, I don't know if you know, but if you don't know, we now are, we are required to qualify twice a year to be certified police officers which has increased our ammo uh, need. Um, ammo has gone up pricing like everything else, and it is extremely difficult to get your hands on. Is that part of the Reform Act? Yes, it is. I think um, that was cut too. Well, it, it's, it, it was brought in prior to the Reform Act. However, in order to be certified as a police officer under the reform requirements and what POST requires is you need to qualify twice a year. So if we don't do that, our, our officers will be decertified by the state, and we don't want that. Um, so that's for the supply ammo. Data maintenance is all our contracts. Um, we had a requested an amount at the beginning of the year, which included all of those. We're currently trying to um, get those all, where we pay them all in the beginning of the fiscal year, in, in, to kind of simplify it. You know, some of them come in sporadically. Um, and so that amount will get us back to what we need to pay those contracts. Are you saying the mayor didn't fund it or the city council cut it? Uh, the city council cut it. Okay. You can say that. <laughs> it's on record. <laughs> yeah. I figured you knew what you did. So. <laughs> um, yeah. um, Thank you, Chief. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, the other is um, repair and maintenance motor vehicle. Um, now this one, so it's a little, you know, there's a little backdrop here with the, the vehicle. So the 2020 vehicles that we currently have, we are w awaiting six new cruisers, but like everyone else, just like everyone who's trying to buy a new car, the chips and everything is delayed, the cars are delayed. So we have been forced to sort of keep these 2020s on the road. Our issues with our 2020s is they use different parts than what the 2017s that we had prior to those. So we can't mix and match parts with these. Um, it's also, the, they have come out of warranty. They're just about to come out of warranty because then we've kept them on the road longer. Um, Ford has not released, like we cannot send those cars for certain things to the DPW mechanic to fix. They have to go back to Ford um, because we don't have the technology or the, not we, but the 
outside of the Ford Motor Company, nobody can fix those cars. It's a cute little move on their part. Um, anyway, so, however, part of this, um, so this, the, so that's what we're anticipating. We also, it's not really our issue, but it becomes our issue. The DPW lost their mechanics, and when that happens, they pull our mechanic, and when they pull our mechanic and we need cars fixed, then our cars end up going out to, uh, you know, out to outside agencies to, to fix things. Sometimes, basically, we just have to do that because it's, it's, it just makes more sense. It gets done actually cheaper by sending it out than keeping it in-house, believe it or not. So, um, and then we have our regular uh, stuff, tires, brakes, oil, all of those things through the supply chain shortages are up in cost. So all of that is sort of uh, hitting us at once. So that's where the money going to that line item and, and we've calculated to the best we can thinking that should get us there to the end of the year with our motor vehicles. The next amount is education and training. So um, currently we, are, we will have uh, the money that will go in there is paying for primarily our officers that go to the academy we're, and we have another academy slated for June 4th. Um, I don't know if uh, it's known to everyone, but it is sort of good news that the police academy is coming to the city of Holyoke. I don't know if you're aware of that. Huh. Uh, the regional academy is going, is going to be in Holyoke. Um, Very cool. So that's, uh, that's a, for, in a small way, I, I guess it'll help us on the budget as far as uh, transportation time to get the guys to the academy because it's much closer um, but uh, it, it's going to open up opportunities they're going to expand the the uh, MPTC is working on bigger academies expanding academies because everybody now has to go to the full-time academy going forward under the new reform bill so they need more academies they need bigger academies this academy will have the capacity to run simultaneous academies as well as in service and um, extra classes, you know, specialized classes, detectives, stuff like that. So um, this money is going to pay for officers going to the academy. Um, and just- Of course, with the, the city and, being and the they, host of the academy, that means we get a, a break on what we pay for the officers? <laughs> hmm. I'll, I'll throw that out at the next meeting, Joe. We'll see Thank how you. that goes. Um, I, I think it does add <clears throat> at least at the very least, I would like to think that it being here in our, our city when they have academies, we'll at least know first and get our chance to get our people in first. And we won't be being deferred from academies waiting for guys to be trained. I think those days will be behind us. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be ready and it'll help us make that turnover where we have those uh, lags in training where guys retire and we're waiting for the academy to start and then a guy starts three or four months later and then six months in the academy. It, so I'm hoping that that'll bring down some of those gaps. Just training in general, our, our training requirements are obviously increasing with the reform bill um, and we're trying to stay on top of all of that. So I think this money is, uh, will get us there. Motor vehicle supplies, um, so we did, just in all transparency, we did transfer some money out of there, but that was directly to pay for the extended warranty on the new cruisers coming in, trying to offset what's happening currently with the 2020 models. The new models we have coming in are gonna be on an extended warranty, so all these problems we're dealing with now, transferring money in to pay for a lot of this stuff on these new cruisers is gonna be covered on an extended warranty. So where our warranties are running out now, that won't be happening as quickly. So I think, although um, it, it, it might seem, it's, it's, it's money for the future, I, I guess is a way to put it, but the motor vehicle supplies going in there, that's just, again, all our stuff we need for motor vehicles to get through. And then um, I think I have here, um, the motor vehicle fuel, this is the one that I, you know, this is like, I don't know how I'm gonna figure this one out, but what we were appropriated, it was cut by the council and um, I, obviously everyone knows fuel prices are up and we were trying to track, but um, we only had about three months of data of what we've paid so far in this fiscal year. 
so it's it's a little but I, I there's a there's a fee plus the cost of the fuel it's probably around 11 grand a month so this should get us right about there to the I, I might even have to come back for more depending on gas prices I, I don't know what's gonna happen um, so that's why we need money in there uh, we definitely will not have enough to pay for the gas if we don't put it in there and office supplies is our uh, it's mainly our toners are what uh, kill us um, so we, we, we go through quite a bit there I believe on that line item I had it uh, that's more <clears throat> You have that one? I don't have it for some reason. I did have it. I, I know that basically what we've allocated here should be enough to get us to the end of the year with our office supplies. Hmm. Was um, it at this point we felt we had the money, it's there. These are line items that are short. I, I do realize that this is a request from personnel to expense, which is always something that you know we want to look at. And so I felt it was important to put it together. We could discuss it all here tonight. Chief, as always, you come well prepared. Um, on office supplies, was that line item cut or funded short of your request at the beginning of the year? Uh, yes, I believe so. Let me double check. And when I say the mayor, I don't mean Mayor Garcia. <laughs> he hasn't had a budget yet. <laughs> so on that one, Councilor Tomlin's got it. No cut. Got it? I don't think there's a cut. Supplies. Right? And the fuel wasn't cut either. They, were they asked? Right here is what they proposed. Supplies. Yeah. No, oh, this, this is Office proposed. of Professional Supplies. That's the mayor. That's us. Okay. Oh, okay. So yeah, is, it was oh, cut. I'm, yeah. yeah, that one was cut by the mayor, the Office of Supplies. Yeah. Oh, the mayor. He was we, yeah, city council left you alone on that one. He was a council <laughs> too, right? <laughs> yeah, he did a double duty. <laughs> he was doing double duty back yeah, then. No problem there. Thank you. Councilor yeah. um, Drain. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I was going to, I was actually, by the way, uh, the, myself and the new councilors, we should be provided a copy of the budget in, in printed form if at, at some point. Uh, Tanya, if you could maybe send those along to the new councilors. Uh, either give them to Jeff or something. To, yeah, we would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, no problem. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about a few of these, Chief. Um, for, first thing, just an overall observation is, um, and, you, and you made a good explanation, but the total appropriation for expenses was 878000 in your budget. This is a request for a hundred and eighty-five thousand increase out of on eight seventy-eight. That's a, like a twenty-one percent increase to your expense lines. That's I don't know if there's been anything else this year for increases before the city council in the first half. Obviously, I'm coming into this into the seventh month of the fiscal year, but that is a that is kind of high twenty-one percent to be off on expenses halfway yeah. through the fiscal year. Well, I, yeah. can I answer that? I, I believe yeah, yeah. that. One million. It was cut million. by about 240. Yeah, 240. So, um, in know, these line yeah. items, though. Yes. Yeah. So, between the mayor and the council, it was cut about 240,000. Yeah. So I'm coming yeah. back for 100. Okay. Let me address. Yeah. 80, 85 right. of the 240 of the cuts. So, I, I know what you're saying, but and a lot of these are um, things that it's not like I have control over the ammo. The vests. I'm not asking you. I'm not going to be asking you about those. Oh, okay. There's a few that I will ask you about, but okay. I will say, your your twenty your fiscal year twenty run rate was eight hundred and seventy nine thousand. Your budgeted rate for twenty one was seven hundred and fifty thousand. Your request was one point one million. I can see why the city council made some cuts. Your current budget is 878516 That's what your ultimately council approved, was 878 which is consistent with your run rate for the last two years. So it's not like, oh my God, this was some radically reduced budget. Now, whether there is some inflationary cost, some portion, I'm just saying is 878 plus 200000 
is 20% more than the prior two fiscal year run rate. Just pointing that out to you. So let me ask you about a couple of these. First one is office supplies. You mentioned that, um, you know, this, this, you need more money here. The prior two year fiscal run rate was 32,000. Budget appropriated was 225. So that's um, 10,000 less, but the request here is for 20,000. So that's double what the, over the run rate of the prior two fiscal years. So it seems like we're coming up 10 grand over on that line item. Any reason why? Toner, I mean, toner hasn't gone up that much that it's 10,000 more than last year. I think John can answer some of that with the toner question. Yeah, some, some of the uh, toners, we, we've gotten a lot more printers um, in our department, and we have uh, one vendor, really, that, that we use, uh, WB Mason. And I know we have talked with the previous mayor about the city and with Larry Belanger about the city contracting one vendor to get a citywide um, contract for office supplies, for contracts for preventive maintenance. We've had preventive maintenance ag agreements with a lot of these printers um, and, and copy machines that we had. Mm -hmm. However, no one was showing up to, to do preventive maintenance on them. So we cut those contracts out because those were costs we, we were paying in the past that, and we weren't getting any services for. So now we cut those out. So now we're looking for more service agreements, but I, I think it's, you'd get a better deal and a lot less cost citywide if you went and contracted with one vendor to get all those supplies, opposed to you know getting some from WB Mason, some from Staples, and some from here. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's what we've been doing. We, we've been actually okay. trying to uh, outsource to other vendors and get them on the on the vendor list so we can you know get better prices. Okay, um, but we may want to take a look at that, um, and I would encourage you to try and stay at the run rates on these different line items because, uh, as you know, money's tight around here. Mm -hmm. Education and training. You mentioned um, the prior run rate of the two prior fiscal years was fifty two thousand. The council appropriated 42. That means that you were short 10 from what you needed, but the request here is for 30. So it looks like 20 more than the run rate for the prior two years. Can you give a little more detail as to why sure. you need more training this year? Is it because of the legislation? 100% like, the, okay. the legislation, the, uh, the, re the training requirements are all up. We sent 10 people to the academy, which is a large number, but we yep. are trying to get our uh, numbers up to that. We're always chasing that full uh, staffing, which can help us with the overtime number, as we discussed. The academy alone is, uh, is it three, 30, three or 35, 3,000 a person okay. to go. Um, so maybe we can talk about that. So historically, so historically, Chief, how many have you been sending per year? This year you said you did 10. Historically, how many would you normally send a year? It varies year to year. I, it really depends on the retirements and, and how many vacancies we have and how many slots. In, in previous years, it would depend on how many slots we could get at the academy. Okay. And I, that's why I, was, I mentioned the academy coming here. I think that won't be an issue. And, and our goal, I mean, ideally, you would like to be only sending three or four at a time. T taking 10 bodies away from your patrol division and sending them off to the academy is a, is a, a costly move. But um, at that point, mm -hmm. um, many of those officers were reserve officers anyway. Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of balance that out. Do you keep your reserve officers back, not send them to the academy, and then not fill those full-time slots? Um, possibly, depending on the, the, the position we were in. Um, we wanted to get them in and get them trained and get them back because we already knew when this academy was starting in October, we were going to face more retirements by January. So if we fall too far behind that, you know, curve, 
we're really going to be in trouble. So we felt we needed to make that push, get our staffing back up. Mm -hmm. These officers would come out, and uh, we, we, as we do currently right now, have four vacancies. My hope is to get four people into that June Academy and mm -hmm. keep, keep us fully staffed because keeping in mind that when you just because you hire someone and now you got to send them off to the academy if there's a delay in that academy starting which has been some of the issues with COVID some of these academies they start and then they stop now because of COVID and then they restart um, you, you, you're not getting that officer back for probably five or six months from mm -hmm. the date you sent them to the academy and if you hire them a lot of times maybe a couple weeks before that or maybe months before that mm -hmm. Or you could hire them months before anticipating a start of academy, then they cancel the academy, and now you're pushed to the next academy. Mm -hmm. These are all months where in now's world, without the, the reserve training, these officers can't work for us. They can't do anything for us on the street. So hiring them prematurely is not a, is not a good practice. Um, so we're trying to time all that out, get them to the academy, and get them back to us so we can get them on the street. Yeah, um, I, I, I think some of that, a big portion of that is for the firing range, isn't it? Um, yeah, I believe coming out of that, we, we pay money to the fire range. And just yeah, so for we're going into next year, they're going they're up they're by they're about $2,000. So that's from that line item, that, yeah, it's, it's 11.5. 11, 11,500. Goes to the range. From that. So from that 42, 11.5 goes right to the range. Is that a new expense? No, no. it's been going on for... So theoretically, that should be in the run rate then, though, would be, would be my point. I want to ask you about one last area, and that is the data maintenance. Run rate's been 82000 per year. The city council gave you 72000 so you were about 10 short. Your request here is for 36000 Our original request was 107400 That was just a list of all the data maintenance bills that we had to pay coming into that fiscal year. And we explained that to the council at the time. Okay. And they looked at the previous years apparently and cut it down to 72. These are all bills that we, you know, for, I, I don't have the list with me. I probably should have right. brought that. We but can it's... get that and you could see it for yourself if you're so inclined. Um, and, you, and you could, I mean, these are just literally, um, John, you can help me out here. They're, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're sieges the, and. Yeah, these are like for our Microsoft. Microsoft, Microsoft uh, like licenses and things. Yes, licenses, mm -hmm. yep. all these licenses. Every year for our the costs are now, going up. Now, is just that so it? You know, we actually cut a program that was costing us upfront money of probably anywhere between twenty and twenty-five thousand, mm -hmm. and moved to a company that moved that money out from us having to pay that upfront. I had to do that because that was above and beyond the one hundred and seven that we had budgeted for. Mm -hmm. So. We knew that, and so that, and that was the 107 was to cover the other expenses. So right. The the only thing I'm just going to say is an overall. I'm going to vote for this. I would yep. just ask the mayor and the and the auditor to keep an eye on these things, and you yep. chief, if you if Absolutely. there's any way to keep. Here's why I say it. If we're running around 850 thousand a year, if we approve this, we're going to exceed over a million, uh, almost a million. Yeah, it'll be about a million fifty thousand dollars if you were to spend all this money that we're about to give you, and that is a fifteen percent increase. Okay, over the prior two-year run rate, that is a high increase rate, and we just, from a budget perspective, you've got to keep it so that unless there's a real anomaly, something comes up, you got to keep it to you know around three percent growth rate no more than that, okay? Uh, otherwise, the trains don't, the, the train cease to run on time. You're just gonna have to figure it out that, you know, there is some cost, take it from here and there, unless, like I say, something out of left field comes up. We just can't afford that kind of growth. In I understand. Lines. I, if you, I'm sure you appreciate that. Okay, 100%. Thank, thank you, sir. Councilor Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Um, my question is on, on the, uh, and luckily they, we have the, the money and the, the budget, the buybacks. How, how, how many um, did they project to retire and then all of a sudden they changed their mind? Employees, is it four or five or is that something yeah. they have, they let you know ahead of time? Yeah, well, um, we have I, to kind of just, we have to just guess, guess or? that. And we do it primarily by an officer's age and time on the job. And, and we, 
if they're if they're eligible, then we need to budget for it because it is definitely an expense that that will come. Um, yeah, I we know that last year we actually put money into that line item, right? Because, because we had extra money because of COVID and the parade. I think you'll remember, and we moved that money into those line items to pay buybacks. Um, and so it, it's kind of that uh, thing. It, it we had I can't remember the number. I want to say there were. Yeah, we six. we kind of averaged. We we looked at the uh, like the five year numbers and we kind of averaged right. around six. Um, we kind of budget for, and sometimes some of those six are supervisors with the old Quinnville and stuff. So those buyouts are, are I will a little say more too expensive. that sometimes we have unexpected buyouts. Right. Like not large buyouts, but they're still there. Um, we just had an officer leave us to go off to another career field. He wasn't retiring, but he is entitled to you know buy back his vacation. His time vacation. You know, like so that. so those pop up as well, and we okay. have officers that leave us for other reasons, injuries, whatever it might be, yeah. and then those are about. We can't predict those no matter yeah, what spreadsheet. It's yeah. kind of like the same principle um, that that the auditor auditor su suggests. If you're coming up for like a, a raids and you're in negotiations, she, she kind of says that we should kind of put in for like a, a, a 3% just to project, just so when you do budget, right. um, it, there's, there are some funds in there. So it's a similar principle uh, with the buyouts and retirements. Yeah. And, and I'll have to agree with Councilor Jordan on, on the, the budget and how the increase, I mean, look at my budget book and I know some things are out of your control, you know, you, you, the, um, the gas, has gone up, uh, you know, exorbitantly. The, uh, you know, the firing range, uh, people going to the academy. Yeah. That's not going to happen every year. I mean, you get sending ten no. people. You might have sent four last year. Or you might have sent six before. So, um, but it, that is a is, is a big percentage, and I think we just have to try to keep an eye on that. And some things are, like you said, out of your control. But you know, every every one of these, you know, like you said, was cut. Um, especially the, uh, you know, the fuel was cut from I think he asked for 125,000 he got 92,000 so that's that's a big difference that's $33,000 and I see you know you're looking for 30,000 and you know with the cost going up could you just really briefly do you go over the the part about the vehicles you said you're out of the vehicles they're they're you're still waiting on the six correct so the six that you know were budgeted for in the in the lease agreement that we've been doing the two-year lease um you know once that money was approved by the council in July or June, late June, then we were able to order them. Uh, and Marcot, we were using going through Marcot um, to do that, um, as they are now a state vendor for the police vehicles. And um, they're, you know, basically it's the chips, you know, that you hear about on TV. Everybody, even if you want to buy a family car, you're waiting on those chips. Well, we're no different. It isn't, well, we'll give all the chips to the police officers. It doesn't happen that way. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're waiting just like everyone else. Uh, they are, they've been ordered. They are set to arrive at Marcotte, we believe, in February, which means we should have them by April, that, you know, with all the upfitting. Updating, yeah. So that's our, that's our, you know, unless something else happens, that's what we're really hoping for and now you're just trying to and keep the those vehicle cars yeah. that come in are going to be under an extended warranty which by doing what we did those ones we're not going to run into this in, in two right. years these will be well under warranty if the chip issue is resolved which i hope in a couple of years it is and we're ordering our next set of cars they'll come quicker those ones will still be under warranty that are coming off the line which is really going to help us because our all our cars that are off the line now are not under warranty clearly. yeah so that is our that is our long term strategic goal to try to deal with the car problems. Andy, I know the the da data main and, and you know management. I know that's a difficult thing, but I know we had Wally Computer, and I know they deal with stuff. So maybe looking at collectively and oh, either yeah. through purchasing, I know the absolutely. Looking at that. You know oh, they're looking right. at that to try to make some savings there because you know that's a big cost. Like you said, you you saved thirty twenty seven thousand or whatever it was. Right. You know that you knew you were gonna have to pay, but those things there's costs and you got to have it. Right. You got you to gotta pay for the licensing, and you, you don't, you know, well, believe, especially in like, your department. I believe going into last year's budget, although it wasn't my budget, I was trying to st stay, you know, up on it and, you know, um, certainly involved because I knew it was going to be the budget I would be operating with. Right. Um, that I do recall that we listed out those, I believe we gave the list to the council at the time of the data maintenance things that we had to pay those contracts. Right. 
So, and, and to the best of our knowledge, what those cost at that time, and that was where we came up with the 107, 400 number, and, and that was cut to, I forget, 72 or something. So, Not yet, so yeah, 72,000. No, I, I know what you're saying, Councilor, and I understand it. Um, I just don't know if you can technically, you know, look at me and say, you know, manage that. I, I, I don't yeah. know how to manage that any better than to hand you exactly what needs to be paid right. and, and say, you know, this is what we need. And when it's cut, I think even at the time, the council said, well, if you have to come back, come back. Right. Well, here I am. You well, know? that's a, that's a, that's a reason like we said, like, we don't give the chunk, yeah. big chunks of money out. We right. come back and, you know, look at things because that way we get an idea. Well, how can we do this? And we I, have the mayor here, and now we can say, okay, yeah, we're looking at the, the contract. We're yeah. looking at the data maintenance, and that's how we get things. Yeah. We get, get some savings, and I know it's not easy, but. Yeah. We have to sometimes ask the questions. I, I to tried to definitely look at that as I was coming back, what was cut, what I'm coming back for, and I tried to stay within that. I didn't look at the two year, but that's a, I will definitely do that going forward. Something to consider. You know, yeah, 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 I did yeah. not do that. Um, I tried to look at the budget I was dealing with and what I'm trying to do going forward. But I, I'm just stating that, like I said, I'm glad you gave me the you know, about the retirements that people sort of maybe change their mind. If they didn't, we'd really be in a tougher position because that money that's in right. those line items, if you didn't have that money there, we would would all right. the stuff get paid out of right. if there's no free cash. So, but uh, it's just to better keep a better eye on that kind of stuff. I think that's you know it's all planning, it's all budgeting, and it's 100%. it's it's not easy. It's a moving target like we heard tonight. So, mm -hmm. yes. all set. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilor Tom. And the chair would like to recognize and call. Uh, Councilor Israel Rivera, who joined us about a good 45 minutes ago, and his hand is up. Is he? Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor McGivern. Um, I just, uh, I was going to ask uh, several questions, but Mr. Jordan kind of, he kind of beat me to the punch um, with a lot of the questions, and a lot of them were answered with regards to what I was going to ask. But then um, I, for a point of clarification with regards to the motor vehicles, um, is it the 2020 vehicles? Um, what it, it, there's an issue with the chip currently, or um, I just I, I'm confused with regards to what what's wrong with the 2020 vehicles? I mean, they're 2020s. <laughs> so, like, yeah, yeah, right. uh, um, in my experience in buying a, a brand, a fairly new vehicle, um, maintenance. That's why I buy a new vehicle. It keeps maintenance costs down instead of buying used vehicles, right? Um, but if it's if it's a, a messed up chip or something like that, that's news to me. So that's why I'm asking for a point of clarification with so, regards to that. So I can answer that. And to the chip uh, thing we were talking about is the new vehicles we have coming in, which will be 2022s. Um, you know, across the country, they're having trouble getting the chips to put into new vehicles. There's a supply shortage of those. So that's what's delayed our new cars to get here. The 2020 vehicles that we currently have, the issues with those are, and keep in mind, um, police, these police cruisers are the ones that want run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, three different drivers every day, multiple drivers a week. Um, so they are run a lot, um, a lot of miles in a short amount of time. And um, they do break down and there are issues with them. The 2020 vehicles, prior to 2020, the newest vehicles we had were 2017s. Those vehicles are not compatible part-wise with the 2020s. So if we had an old 2020 17 that we wanted to put parts into, we aren't a lot, we aren't, we don't have the capability to do that any, you know, whereas in years past, we would yep. use say like a 2015 and a 17 and they were interchangeable and we could move parts around. We aren't able the to The models do that. change every few years. Yes, correct. So. Yep. Um, that's where we're at with that. So the 2020s, um, we've had some issues with them. Um, I think a lot of people have had issues with the 2020 models that came out. Um, and, and we are past our warranties on those. So those are all things that we have to, to pay. The newer ones so my last in are going to, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, finish. So the newer ones that are coming in, we are, we are, we got a extended warranty with those ones as part of the package deal so that hopefully in a couple of years we won't run into this again with the newer ones that will be here hopefully by april okay and then my last question is uh, like with like it's kind of similar to what, what jordan was saying with, around like the supplies and and um education and training with the money that's that is being asked to be transferred in so if 
if we provide, if we say yes to this and we get the 20,000 for office supplies, this is for from January until June, right? And then come July, you'll be, it'll be a new request. New budget. Well, it'll be for in the, the new fiscal budget, budget in, the new, in budget. the new fiscal year? In the new fiscal budget, yes. Mm -hmm. This is what we need to get to the end of the fiscal year. So $20,000 for office supplies from now until June? Correct. Okay. All right, then. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rivera. If I could just say two things. Uh, on the cruiser uh, question you asked about uh, buying new and, and the conditions of the cruisers now, I asked the same question 40 years ago. Got the same answer, except about the chips. There were no chips 40 years ago. <laughs> On your reference to Councilor Jardine, it's amazing how you and, Ke you and Kevin think a lot alike. Oh, yeah. I know. I, I've been picking up on that, too. <laughs> how are we doing? It's Any ironic. It's ironic. <laughs> Mayor Garcia. I was just going to add it in reference to uh, budget. Uh, the earlier points on that, uh, just so that the committee is aware that the instructions we sent out to each department was to either try your best to level fund and find ways to reduce costs. And when, if you're going to propose a budget that's going to increase above the level fund amount to be prepared to explain in detail why, because obviously I'm going to be here with departments meeting with you guys going over the budget, you know, for those departments that are going over that level funded amount comparatively to the last two fiscal years. Yeah, we want to stay within a modest percentage increase. The only, just so you're aware ahead of time, if there is like an above a 2% or a 3% increase for a given department, primary, if, if it's not an unforeseen situation we got to resolve or, or whatever the case, it might be just around, uh, um, I know there's been a lot of talk about salaries for positions, department heads, retention being an issue. That's where you might see the, 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 you know, anything above the normal of an increase for a given department. But just so you're aware though, um, for everything else, I'm hoping that whatever increase there is, be it a 0.1% a, a, a to a potential 20%, that folks are gonna be prepared, uh, hopefully to the best of the extent possible, be prepared to explain in detail where those increases might go and some of them might be miscellaneous because for whatever unforeseen but at least like where you know the expectation is to have departments be transparent on that front so you know uh, uh, if you know what what the budget is that we're presenting that you're essentially supporting so to your point about the the two percent the last two years compared you're absolutely spot on and I want departments to um, uh, uh, stay any modest in, any increase that it's modestly within that percentage and that we're all ready to be on the same page including myself and you guys to be on the same page on reasons why if there is a uh, uh, what can be foreseen as a substantial increase um, historically if <coughs> compared to previous fiscal years but I put that point out there Thank you. mayor there's a couple line items on page 52 of the budget um, one of them being health insurance will that uh, percentage apply to health insurance too <laughs> Don't have to answer that now. <laughs> I, I can answer that. Sure. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, hopefully, I, I think there's a lot of um, good move. Move. There's some internal movement happening around having a stronger set of eyes put on that. Part of that includes Councilor Jordan joining the team and helping us out on that front. So working collaboratively with Kelly Curran. Sounds like fun. Yep. Chair, entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the transfer. Motion second. and second approve the transfer. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Also moved. I, I actually, did you not see my hand up? Oh, if you, your hand up. came up, I'm, I apologize, Councilor Anderson Burgos, but did it just come up? No, it's been up for a while. I so there must you. be something wrong with this laptop here. Councilor I, Anderson I, Burgos, I, my apologies. I, it's, it's totally fine. And I, my apologies if, um, if I had missed this, but this is definitely um, a question regarding the vehicles, the 2020 vehicles. Um, are, what are we doing with the 2020 vehicles? Are we keeping them? Are we selling them back? What are we doing with those vehicles? We're keeping them. So... Wouldn't it be better to sell them back? If, I mean, if, if we can't fix them, 
wouldn't it be better to sell them back? Like, so say for example, if I wanted to trade in my car and get money back for that car, and so the purchase of the new vehicles would be cheaper. Wouldn't that be a better option? I mean, that's just me. I don't know how the police department handles it and what would be better. I'm not saying that I'm, you know, I'm a specialist in that, but I, I just want to see how we can save the city money, the department money, and did we look at that option? I think, I think it's important to understand that the six we have and the six we getting are nowhere near the amount of cars we have. Um, there is some cars at the bottom end so exactly what you're talking about that are to the point where they're not repairable. Those are the ones that kind of go out the door. These cars, believe it or not, even though they may have 70, 80, 100,000 miles on them, are still better than some of the cars that are on the bottom end of our fleet. So they will rotate into areas where they're not used 24-7 so that it, it helps extend their life. So when we say fix them, it's not that we can't fix them. It's that we can't fix them internally at some point ford will release the technology to allow outside people to to fix those cars and, and then we'll, we will be able to do that say through the dpw so, so it's not well, like these cars are you know broken and we can't fix them we can fix them right now the only people that can fix them are the ford motor company technicians. well what ford has done is a separate frustrating conversation I would and that's I not going to be had now <laughs> but I will say so then my question is sort of a follow-up so are you saying that some of the cars that you will be get, getting rid of will be going towards the value of the new cars so we have a, a system our, our mechanic and our officer that works with the mechanic has a rating system um, that uh, we take all our cars and for various factors of the way we use those cars, they, they receive a rating. And the higher the rating, then the more closer they are to, uh, let's just call it the retirement pasture for the vehicle. And then when the new vehicles come in, we get six new vehicles in, we assess what we have left. And, and some of those at the very bottom end, some of them at that point aren't even running, and we will rotate them out. Um, especially now, like I was talking, some of those can't be used for parts on the newer ones, but some of those can be used for parts on, a, on an older model vehicle. So say like a 2017 vehicle that we may still have might be able to use a part from a 2014 or 15 vehicle. So we may, it may make sense to hang on to that vehicle because of the value of the parts that can go into a vehicle that is repairable. I know, I know that's kind of, uh, you know, not 100% answering your question, but it is being tracked. We do have a rating system that, the, you know, believe me, someone a lot smarter than me with the cars is dealing and in, in, in giving me that information. Um, so I, I trust what they're doing. I, I think that it makes sense. And we talk about it and we talk about if they're gonna, they don't remove a car and just, you know, nilly willy take it off the line. We talk about it, we discuss the pros and cons, and then we make an educated decision when the new cars come in that what needs to get off. Some of them need to come off the road for safety reasons. They're just not roadworthy at that point. So we get rid of those. Okay, so this is probably a conversation for the future and I'd like to look into, see how I can help the, the get involved and help the, the department make better decisions on what we do with our old vehicles. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Motion on the floor is to adopt the recommend tomorrow night. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, so moved. Aye. Chair, Chair would ask that we take items eight and nine together as a package. So moved. Motion may take a second. Eight and nine as a package. All those in favor? Any Aye. Opposed, so moved. <clears throat> uh, we have 10 city councilors here this evening. I think we want to get to uh, the middle school bond. We're behind on schedule. But on eight and nine, Councilor McGee had an unexpected work commitment. Chief, he just, the president just asked me to ask you, I think nine is an ongoing question about, you know, the finance committee discussed staffing issues with the department. I think we hear that as we talk about transfers and stuff. And I don't know if you have a report available for that. And item number eight is more specific about the fourth captain. And it, rather than getting into a lengthy discussion this evening, is there anything you, the mayor, may want to present this evening we can get to Councillor McGee and bring it up at the uh, a future meeting. 
I did not come with any documentation. Okay. Um, I just uh, I, I thought the, the mayor was going to talk about this briefly. I will say that I read those two orders as kind of combined. The staffing issues I'm currently dealing with yeah. are shortages with supervisors, and this is helping me to fill that gap. Yeah, I can't speak for Councilor McGee, but I, I, I think that's what he's looking for. Mayor, I, I really like to get into the middle school, but there's anything you'd like to add at this point? or? Yeah, no, I, it's just, so Councilor, I had communicated information to Councilor McGee regarding um, uh, the circumstance as it exists when it comes to supervisor position seven of which are out for whatever circumstance that each one is individual to is specific to the individual and so that's where the where i believe the uh, a portion or a, pro, a part of the problem with the overtime situation is supervisors covering for for supervisors um to make sure that we have that gap filled well it's five that are that are that um have bodies in those positions that are out for whatever reason two of which uh includes um, a lieutenant and a captain position, um, I, I guess, in the chief's budget. Mayor, that's right, two above the five, so it's seven total. Right, so it's seven total. So right. five that have bodies, two that, are, that have no bodies because of what I was just about Monday. to explain, correct? Correct. All right, so the mayor, the, the chief presented a budget that had only three captains funded and uh, uh, the lieutenant. Um, the mayor was... Um, presented a budget instead, uh, a fourth captain uh, and no lieutenant, primarily because it, through a conversation with the department head, it was uh, a consensus that the chief position um, was much more desirable, I guess, than the lieutenant position. If, and if I'm wrong, feel free to jump in. Yeah, the captain's position. Was, was a, right. The former mayor. Correct. Sorry, I said chief, didn't I? Yeah. The captain position. <laughs> The, the budget got presented to the council, the council cut the captain position. So it was almost like a double whammy for the police department. No lieutenant, no captain. So that's two supervisor Correct. positions. The mayor cut the lieutenant's funding, the council cut the captain's funding. That's what it is. So you have five supervisor positions with bodies that have been out for whatever circumstance. Four medically and one on military leave. Then two that just weren't funded. And so what the, what the chief has been working on, um, not only getting those bodies out of the academy to, to, to boost up uh, the, uh, the patrol um, folks, but also getting the bodies we need um, uh, to cover these, the, you know, the, the supervisors back and into their roles so that we're having less uh, dependency on uh, uh, overtime to cover these supervisor positions. Did I capture that? Good. Perfect. Good. All right. So I, I explained that to, to the council president, and certainly um, the council president, you know, um, uh, wanted to have this open discussion um, so that uh, the full council was aware and had the opportunity to ask the chief any questions uh, beyond, uh, beyond that, just for transparency purposes. But that is part of the challenge happening at the police department, impacting um, uh, the, uh, the overtime and uh, going to one of two of those items, um, an opportunity to fund uh, a fourth captain to explore if whether or not um, uh, having four captains makes any impact uh, to the budget. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a conversation McGee was uh, involved with and, and for full transparency, McGee wanted to bring this to the council, have an open discussion, so you're clear on what it is we're working on and uh, can have an opportunity to ask whatever questions you want on that front. Thank you. <clears throat> and, I, and I do know Councilor McGee is uh, sincerely apologetic for, mm -hmm. for this last minute not being able to show. And, uh, and I appreciate your comments. I think the idea I'm suggesting is that we want to table this mm -hmm. so that we can have a discussion with, with President McGee here and not repeat it if we have a discussion tonight and have to go back to it again. Yeah, just so you're aware, Councillor, yeah, you can, you can table because it's purely informational. It's not anything we need a decision on or anything, but just instead informational so you know what the strategy is um, as far as, you know, the chief and I are concerned. Okay. Councillor Bacon. Thank you. I just want to make one brief comment because I know you want to table this. 
Um, I just want to thank Chief Pratt for having an open door policy. He's invited each and every counselor in to meet with him. There's a lot of complicated issues going on, and it's, I think, our biggest department. And so I encourage all the new counselors to take advantage of that open door and go have a face-to-face -face conversation and ask whatever questions you want. I don't know Chief Pratt separately from the roles we're both in right now, and I just found him very forthcoming, and I encourage each counselor to just uh, take advantage of the sit down. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, also for coming in tonight. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Bacon and uh, Chief. That is uh, commendable. We, we under, I think most of us are scheduled in taking advantage of that. Biggest department, I think it's the most expensive department too. <laughs> Just smiling, you know. <laughs> Councilor Jordan. Yo. First, uh, just a, I want to second what Councillor Vacan said. I want to thank the chief. Extremely uh, impressed with uh, your open door policy. Um, just a very engaging conversation I was able to have with you that just very quickly turned into a three hour uh, meeting. And uh, just thank you so much. We were able to cover a lot of ground and I, I really appreciate that and uh, very helpful. Um, on this topic, we're going to table it obviously, but if you can kind of make the case with some sort of financial analysis around about, you know, by adding a captain and adding a lieutenant, this is exactly sort of map it out for the finance committee, how this saves on overtime and, and really kind of show us the numbers on it, that would be extremely helpful. So that when we do talk about it, you know, we've kind of got that all in front of us. That, that's my plan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chair, entertain a motion? Motion to table, table nine. Uh, eight and nine. Motion and second that we eight. table eight and nine. There's no discussion on that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Chief, Lieutenant Hart, thank you. Yeah. Much appreciated as yep. always. Have and a good night. Yeah, thank thanks, you for Chief. being prepared. To our thank members. You, Chief, thank you. Thank you. To our members of the school building committee, welcome. I, I, I projected uh, that we would start your part of the meeting about 7.30, quarter of 8. I'm off by One hour. 45 hour. minutes. We did start late, but I was partially responsible for starting late. So I have to take the hit there. And uh, I, forgot to, I forgot to factor in the Kevin Jordan hour. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Please, if you feel comfortable, come in with the mayor. Feel comfortable, stay Shots where you fired. are, you're welcome. But whichever works for you. There's mics there, there's mics in here, and there's mics out there. We, while you're coming in, I noticed um, we have a few people online about this issue. Uh, certainly our auditor is always with us in the Finance Committee. Aaron Linville from the School Department. Uh, Anthony Soto. Anthony Soto, our, our Superintendent Chief. Aaron Fontaine Burnell is on Zoom with us. Uh, she chairs the School Building Committee and is a School Committee person. And I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a few people, not to mention we have 10 city councilors here. Uh, school committee member uh, Willahan sitting in the back. And there, school committee Wellhan is with us with us in, in person. <laughs> school committee Wellhan, member of the building committee. David Yost, member of the building committee. And of course, uh, Mark Lubo, former city councilor and member of the building committee. And we always, always welcome Whitney Anderson, who we know is the heart and soul of every building in the school department budget. Thank you. Um, real quick, we've had a presentation by the school building committee and by the superintendent about the middle school proposal, both in the joint committee of the school committee and city council, once with the finance committee. Tonight is our second look at a bond request for the design phase of the middle school. Um, that doesn't mean we don't want to know how far we are with the with the project, it's important, and, and certainly there could be questions about that. But we have some answers for questions that were posed at the last finance committee meeting. Um, both our, our uh, bond council, Cinder McNary, who I love saying has been our bond council for the city since 1973. Wow. Um, an incredible, incredible asset to the, uh, to the city and, and to, I know, a number of communities um, throughout the Commonwealth. She is just tremendous. Um, we, we, we want to get into that this evening. We want to try to get all the questions answered. And we do have a time constraint on this, being that the MSBA 
is looking to approve this project and their deadline is, remind me, April, April 29th, but us submitting it should be well before April 29th. So we're, we're trying to keep, on, keep focus on that. All right, with that in mind, I suggest to the committee that we get back to where we were. Um, if I could go to the superintendent or the mayor first on questions that were asked and answers that were submitted. Would anybody like to uh, take us through that? Yeah, so at the January 10 meeting, um, there were <coughs> a, a, a series of questions the finance committee wanted us to investigate. And I don't, I mean, I guess I can go over some, some of these. Well, I can go one, you can do one that's related to you and so forth, right? So the first question here asks that the mayor provides something in writing to the council guaranteeing that bonding for the school project will not lead to any future debt exclusions for any other service in the future. And my response to that question as identified in the memo, the mayor is unable to provide this at this time since Holyoke does not have a capital plan and it's unclear what our needs are that may trigger the need for a debt exclusion in the future. However, I am certainly committed to working with Holyoke employees and the council to build a capital plan for the city to project the short and long-term needs. And it's also important to know that the city has demonstrated a need uh, for new school building. Um, I did, you know, prior, prior to meeting, I met with Cinder prior to meeting her, um, you know, I, I, and, and also I spoke with our, our own auditor and asked her if that was an appropriate response to make sure I wasn't, if there was anything that I'm missing and, and certainly, um, uh, that's, you know, that's just the, the response to that. Um, did you want to just continue that or do you just want to focus on that first before? Um, we, why don't we go one at a time and to the makers of the question and see if there's any, if that answer satisfies yeah. or what they're looking for. Councilor Jardine made that question. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, just so we're under, clear on the ask, the ask was not just about debt exclusions, but tax overrides overall. The concern by some, um, myself included, is that is there any potential that the $1.3 million commitment, if we were to fund this, would cause a budget liquidity problem such that we can't make the bond payment without causing the city to have the fiscal stress that another department would not have sufficient funds so that we would need an override, not for this, but it would cause an override for police services, DPW trash, you know, those kind of things. The point is, if there's only so much, if it's like a balloon, if you squeeze here, you know, it bulges out and pops out over here. And I just wanna make sure that we can healthily take this on, the 1.3, without causing our budget to go into distress. The 1.3? Yes, because the way I'm seeing it, as I understand the numbers, and cor please correct me if I'm wrong, is 74 million, state's going to pay 44, we're going to pay 30. Um, our 30 is going to be a 1.8 million a year payment. Sure. The schools are going to give us a half a million of it, so our share is going to be 1.3. So that's the math on it. By all means, correct me if I'm wrong on any of those numbers. So the question is, can we healthily for the next 30 years pay 1.3 without causing distress to other areas? One point. So the response really here, Councillor, is that the that is what we want to figure out. Uh, we're currently in the feasibility phase to button things up, identify what the cost is going to be for the city for the total overall construction of the project of which we can then, you know, communicate with uh, our bond council and make that determination as far as, you know, what liquidity we have to afford that. And if there were other projects in the pipeline, you know, what capacity do we have to tackle those projects without having to do, assuming there's no local revenue we can tap into a debt exclusion since we'll, if we were to hit that levy ceiling. Um, but I did want to, I know Tanya was on a call with me with Cinder, and I don't want to misspeak or misshare any information either. But Tanya, was there? If I'm sorry to put you on. The, if there's any information you can share 
on that front, because I know you and I spoke extensively, and I just want to make sure that Kevin's, to some extent, even, even if he disagrees with it, just want to make sure that we're able to answer him the best we could. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do feel like our conversation with Cinder was, the, was uh, just what Counselor Jordan, Jordan was speaking about, was do we have the ability in our, in our budget to fund those payments? And so when we were speaking, what she said was that we need to do the feasibility first. We need to know exactly what we're looking at for expenditures, see what we can, see what the reimbursement rate is going to be from the MSBA to see how that payment would impact our budget. She did also say that interest rates are now going up as well. So like the faster that we can look into it, the better it might be for us because our payments might be lower. So I guess I'm a little confused by that answer in that the 475 is not funding a, a financial feasibility study on the bond payments, is it? I mean, isn't that just really more the math? I mean, we... Well, aren't you going to decide, like, what type of, of building you're going to, what type of facility you're going to build? I don't know. No, I don't, no, I, no, because... The ask on this question has nothing to do with wh what we build or what we spend the money on. All we need to know is certain financial assumptions like assumption one, we've been told. I mean, this was pretty clear at the last meeting. $74 million, State would pay $44. We'd pay $30. We run an amortization table. I believe we used 4 or 4.5% 4 as our assumption. That would be a 1.8 million payment minus the 500, 1.3. So the question is, can we afford 1.3? Now, if you want to add a level of a margin of safety on that that says, well, it could be 1.1, it could be 1.5, you know, um, to use you know the the Warren Buffett margin of safety analysis. Okay, sure, put some ex put some extremities to that, but. I'm assuming you would say, well, we couldn't afford $2 million, but we could afford $1.3, we could afford $1.5. I'm not sure why we can't do that analysis. I think, I'm sorry, Council, I think that, that that level of analysis was done, which is why Council had concluded, or Bond Council concluded that we have the ability to take on this project. I think, but to your point though, you want to know beyond that project, what additional capacity we'll have in case for for something else? Um, Is that well? No, I want. She says yes, but see, you have to be very succinct in the questioning. The answer is yes. We could take on. If somebody said to me, "Can you afford 1.3?" You answer yes. But what are the ramifications of that? Does that mean that we now have no more liquidity, so that if we look at the budget, it's growing at this percent, we consider what the reasonable projections on receipts, what other debt we have, what other capital we may need over the next five to 10 years. Because this is a 30 year commitment to this $1.3 million. And the question is, can we do that without having, and we can tell the public, we won't need an override if we do this to fund general operations of the city as a result of us approving that. Because I want to make sure we're not just funding this saying, oh, we got around this, we, we got the school booked, we're all set there. And then, as I said with the balloon analogy, we then three years from now say, we're in a, we're in a cash crunch because we got to fund this payment. Now we don't have enough to do the next capital project like we eliminate all the liquidity is my point. So th that's that's the key sort of I think if we're going to if this was a private sector organization okay I want to make sure that we have enough liquidity that we can fund this payment cuz that's what we're saying is we're not uh, doing it by override that's what the public has asked us not to do is by override. Mm -hmm. I don't want to create 
a separate override for police, fire, DPW by funding that's this. What, that's, that's the part that we don't, we just not, I mean, knock on wood, but there will never be in a position that we have to do an override to fund general operations. I mean, it's not a position any community would want to be in. Um, uh, but that's not to say who knows what's, what circumstance is going to exist in the future that's going to, you know, limit our ability to, you know, so it's, it's just, a, it's a really, I guess to my point, Councilor, is that it's a very tough target to, 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 to hit at, at this point. But what I do know presently, the question, uh, as far as the feasibility is concerned, you know, where, I guess you're talking about the general construction of the whole entire project. Here, we're just looking for a vote to secure funds that we might not even need uh, to uh, get us to the next phase so we can do the number crunching necessary and you know, include that with the actual analysis that, that, that you're looking for to, to better understand if, if, if whether or not, you know, you know what I mean? I, but whether, That's where we are. Yeah, but, but whether we were going to build a, a base on the moon or we were going to build this middle school, this is all about the financial analysis of the cities, where we're going and spending it on and feasibility studies and all the wonderfulness that will go into. I'm sure they'll come up with a, a beautiful building. The, the issue here is I don't want to spend a half a million dollars on something to study a project we can't afford. See, I need to get over the threshold of, and I want to support this if we can afford it. If we can't afford it, then we need to go to plan B. But if we can afford it, then let's do it. And if it's something healthily we can afford without crashing the finances of the city, and I'll tell you, you know, if you play back the quotes from two years ago, a lot of people made a lot of statements about justifying why we had to have a tax override. And in it, they said, we have to have an override because the city can't afford it. So now two years later, everybody's saying, Cinder included, by the way, who said we can't afford it without an override. She's now saying you can afford it without an override. And I want to make sure that the people of this community are getting it straight from their leadership that we can afford this and we're not going to create a future impending override for other areas by funding this. As a fiscal steward, I have an obligation to make sure that, as, as you do and everybody else in the room, that we are healthily taking on debt we can afford. And that's, that doesn't require me spending 475 on this, which appears justified. It's just, it doesn't answer the question of the fiscal health of the community. That's, that's the issue that, that's presented in this question. The, the two new middle school project, uh, the city couldn't afford it. That's why the question went, there, there was a question for a vote mm -hmm. um, so that we were able to secure the, the revenue source to cover the cost of the project. Um, uh, through this council's or the previous council, I guess, before the new ones got elected, the discussion was revisited with bond council about one middle school. And I mean, for those that are available or can probably explain better than me, but it was presented to the council that if with one school, the dollar amount presented, that that was um, uh, a, a project the city can afford. Now, again, if, if whether or not there's a, a, another service that's, that's gonna come in front of us that we might and need a, a, a debt exclusion, I can't, like I can't, we, we don't. Well, you're the boss. So if you don't know, who is gonna know? I don't think any local government uh, professional in this capacity can ever answer what an anticipated cost is gonna be in the future that the city might not be able to afford on its own that's gonna lead to a, a, a debt exclusion vote. Within some reasonable projection, I think we need to take an inventory of our situation. It, certainly, well, my opinion is, and certainly my advice is, I need to think on some level of what is my three, four, five year at a minimum. After that, it, the picture gets cloudy, I agree. But over the next three, four, five year horizon, I mm -hmm. can safely say, I don't have anything major coming up. If, and again, you know, they take away all our local aid, there's all these other assumptions, but assuming reasonable as things stand and as we can reasonably project, 
is this affordable? Um, I, I do agree it becomes more murky after that. But um, I, if I can't even get that assurance, it becomes difficult to support this when, what am I do? Am I setting the city up for another override for, for general operations if I just vote for this and I don't know better? It, you know, if I don't have an answer to this that says, no, we can afford this, I, but, you know? Yeah, I, I, well, I think you get, you get my point. I, 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 I do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Keeping on. Thank you. <laughs> Keeping on item number one, uh, first up with a hand was uh, the chair of the school building committee, Aaron Burnell. Thank you, Mr. McGiven. Um, I actually had a point to your initial comments. So the deadline is not April 27th the, for the MSBA to invite us into feasibility. Um, we need to have the funding secure for feasibility by the 27th for them to hear us in their June meeting. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Thank you. Also with the hand up is our superintendent, Anthony Soto. Yeah, I was just hoping to provide a little bit of clarity around whether or not the city can afford and, and Cinder's analysis. So what led to the unanimous vote by the city council to come to a resolution saying that they have reviewed the finances and do want to move forward uh, with uh, to be invited into the eligibility period was an analysis that Cinder did um, about a year ago. And what that analysis showed was that the city's budget appropriation for debt would not increase as a result of this project. So some would, some would suggest that that is proof that it could be affordable, um, but it is merely taking a look at the existing debt, how much the city budgets uh, annually for that debt, what debt is falling off by when, and what the new appropriation for debt would be once the, the debt obligation would have to start kicking in for this project. So the city's budget for uh, debt was about 4.8 million in FY21. And if we were, you know, assuming the four and a half percent, Assuming the PEC site, assuming the five hundred thousand dollar contribution with the from the school department, the the budget the city would need to continue to fund in their budget for debt would continue to be four point eight million. So, according to the analysis that Cinder did, the the budget wouldn't increase for uh, debt service as a result of this project. And she actually, you know, projects out, you know, through, I want to say 2050, where you can actually see more debt falling off. So, you know, in 20, you know, you, you mentioned five years, if we go out to, you know, 2030 or 2037, according to her analysis, the debt, the debt obligation would be 2.9 million or 2 million. So, what it doesn't account for is the things that, that Josh is saying he can't, uh, that Mayor Garcia is saying it doesn't have enough information on is what is the city's capital plan? In the next 10 years, you know, what are the things that they're gonna have to fund and include in the debt schedule that's not included in Cinder's analysis? Um, I hope that that helps clarify, you know, when we say Cinder provided an analysis that says the city can afford it. It was merely looking at how much does the city budget for debt? When we add this project in and go out to the years where, where the city's gonna have to start paying for the bond, how much is the city gonna have in their budget for debt? The, it doesn't change according to Cinder's analysis. So um, that's really helpful, um, Mr. Soto. I really appreciate that. Um, 
it would be helpful if we could get a copy of that analysis. Again, for the newer people that weren't on the council from a year ago, that would be good to, to have an opportunity to review. So again, if everybody's comfortable, Cinder's comfortable, Mayor's comfortable, you're comfortable, just simply send us a letter, send us a statement that says, <clears throat> we won't have any overrides, as long as we don't exceed, if it's 4.8 million uh, that we have, um, we're not gonna need any tax overrides, we're not gonna have any debt exclusions needed, um, we're good. You know, I think we can check the box on this. What I don't want anybody to say is, nobody asked and we fund this and then two years from now, oh my God, we need an override on X. And then, you know, it's gonna be, well, we told you we could fund this, but now we got this override over here that we couldn't afford, so now we do need an override and blah, blah, blah. I just want us, if the, if the game plan is 4.8 million a year is the magic number, then if I'm hearing that we won't exceed 4.8 million over the year and that's something we can healthily afford, then we need the people that Cinder and whatever we pay her and all the, the finance team needs to say the city can afford 4.8 and our projections are we can continue to afford 4.8, we're good. I, I would feel comfortable supporting the 1.3 um, as, as long as I just make sure we're override free. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jardine. I, I just want to add, then there's a couple more hands up. The $475,000 and, and design phase is municipal government done backwards from the private sector. But there's nothing we can do about that. It's, it's we do have to get through a divine design phase to know where we are. Um, I, the school building committee, and correct me when I'm wrong, um, Anthony, Aaron, you know, but the school building committee and, and the city council has had a lot of good representatives, including over the past year, now three city council members have served on the school committee building, you know, in different, in different uh, times and somewhat together. And, and I think it's been a very transparent and open process. But one of the important things is that the building committee has elected to stay with the same OM and essentially stay with part of what has already been worked out with the two middle school buildings to a degree. And, and we are already paying for that, although we were 80% reimbursed by the MSBA for that original design phase. We've already bonded for that and we're paying, uh, and Tanya, you can correct me for wrong, but I think our 20% was a little less than half a million. Tanya That's loves correct. to, thank you. And, and we're protecting that investment already by going forward with some of the stuff that has already been proposed and designed. And, and I'll stop there. Um, I don't know if hands, I'm gonna recognize a couple of committee members because their hands went up first and we'll go back to everybody. But Councilor Anderson Burgles. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I just wanna say a statement. I've been listening and you know, when I respectfully, Councillor Jordan, when I when I hear you asking is for a letter that promises for promises that can't be kept and it's unreasonable and it's almost, in my opinion, it feels as you're asking this because you know you'll get a no because there's no possible way making it easier for you to say no to this. So what I feel deep in my gut is that you just don't want the schools. You don't want to pay for any of it. You want them to pay for it all. And it's not going to happen. Are we going to continue this? This is ridiculous. It's not going to happen. You're asking for something you know you can't get. They can't promise you those things. So why you keep asking? So it's easier for you to sit back and say no. That's all I have to say. Rebutting, Councilor Jordan. Yes, uh, I, it basically it's a standing item on the agenda, uh, rebutting statements that Juan makes that are inaccurate. Um, so we'll just once again rebut things that Juan says that are inaccurate. So let's, let's start with, we had an override and there was a lot of fanfare about an override. And the public spoke quite clearly about the override and two thirds of them said, I don't want an override. 
And so I'm here to make sure that thy will be done, okay, to paraphrase the Lord's Prayer. I want to make sure that the voter's oh word my God. Is, is handled. All right. Can we have some order, please? And, yeah. and, and gentlemen, you know, let's get through this and get back to the uh, well, what's in front of us. But Councilor Jordan has the floor. Thank you. So I want to make sure that the voters' uh, will is done here. They don't want us to create overrides and, cr and stress the city's finances to a point that we're going to create an override. And if that's the case, then it's very simple to just say that. We're not going to create a situation that we cannot not financially, healthily support this. And if that's the case, I don't think there's any problem people saying that. And not with caveats, not with asterisks. Uh, or any of that, we are not playing tiddlywinks here. We're playing with the city's financial future. And when we need to make sure that we can afford these things, and if people are going to make decisions, they need to be able to stand behind those decisions and make representations that this community can afford it. So if we can afford it, say we can afford it. And that's all I'm asking for. And um, I'm just going to make sure that those things happen. And I'm asking that they be put in writing so that it doesn't happen two, three years from now. Well, that's not what I meant. Go back and play the tape. You know, and there's all these caveats. That's not, I meant debt exclusion. I didn't mean regular override. I, you know, no, 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 no. I've been, I've been around here too long, a lot more than four years for some others. And I've seen how this movie plays out. And I want to make sure that when we say we can afford it, people are willing to back that up and put it in writing. These are very, very expensive items. You would ask for that. God, you buy a car, they put the terms in writing. I would expect when you're spending $74 million, nobody here should have a problem saying you can afford it in writing. Thank you. Mayor Garcia. So to say if we can afford it, I mean, right now I can say that we can afford it to cut. Now, I can't dictate circumstances that happen in the future. And I see your point, but to, re you know, to say earlier comments when we were meeting with the chief municipal finance just doesn't work that way. You, you can't, as a manager in municipal management, commit to things that you don't know what's going to happen in the future. I'm with you. I, I, I want to defray costs as much as possible. I, 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 um, I, you know, I think there's a new fiscal watchdog in town, and I'm going to work with you and do what we can to make sure that we're spending uh, municipal resources, taxpayer resources accordingly. You know, We do also have a responsibility to our school children, so we have to find the balance. Um, I think here what we want to do is get beyond this phase in front of us so that we can get closer um, uh, to getting to a point where we can agree to the dollar amount necessary to move forward with the actual construction phase. Um, now, again, this 475, I might, you know, we have here a question in front of you um, uh, to approve uh, or authorize um, the, the ability to, to get out, a, to take out a bond to do this project, but chances are, again, we, we might not need it. We just need the vote so we can let MSBA know and they can open the doors for us to go to the next phase in their process. Um, um, but, you know, it, you know it's, it's certainly the phase that we're trying to get through so we can get closer to your point, Councilor, um, and trying to make sure that whatever costs are being thrown at us that we can indeed afford it. Um, you know, I, I, Bond Council, I, I can see you were here much longer than I have, so I can see why, you know, you, you hear one thing, the total opposite happens on the other, on the other side or later on and, and vice versa. Um, you know, the municipal world is a, it continues to be a, a, min, a, a moving target and, and uh, you know, the taxpayers do indeed expect us to be as transparent as transparent as possible and something I'm certainly looking forward to, to, to do. It's just, I, you know, there's a bit of a challenge on my end to commit to something. I don't know what's going to happen three years from now. Um, 
that's 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 the difficult part and that's why i can't put that in writing um but can we afford it right now i can say yeah because that's what's being presented to me from the so-called experts um uh, and hopefully as we proceed forward we can be sure that we're doing what we can to continue to hit our target thank you mayor um I, I think affordability is a very relevant turn and, and i understand councilor jordan and what i think we're trying to say is we want to make it affordable but i i would add after saying we want to make it affordable with you know understanding is first bond council can tell us where we are where we've been and project where we're going but bond council is it's not their job to tell us what we can afford that's our job and i think that's that's what we're we're here about and again because it's municipal financing we're doing it somewhat backwards talking about feasibility and design and we should be talking about what the you know what the real cost of the projects the projects are but you know my my real thoughts are can we afford not to do this and and we forget that over the last five years to your left mayor whitney anderson our our current superintendent our, our former receiver superintendent uh you know, we have gone through a, a incredible analysis of all school buildings. Yeah. We can't afford not to start building a school or we're just passing on the unaffordability of what the MSBA is not paying for to our grandchildren. And that's wrong. You know, we, we need to start doing something with our, with, with our fleet of schools in this city, pardon the expression, because I think Councilor Anderson Burgos likes talking about cars, but we need to start building. And this is a this is not a plan about one school. This is a plan about closing schools, about consolidating, and about doing the right things so that the future generations aren't paying three times, five times as much as what we're being asked to pay now. Councilor Bacon. So just briefly, because I know everybody's on the same page about what the issue is, but I guess for myself, I would feel more comfortable if I felt that our new mayor had had an opportunity to sit down, look at the debt projections, and be able to get an understanding of the mandated capital projects that we are under in terms of our CSOs, our water filtration, et cetera, et cetera, <coughs> when we're looking out at this bonding project. Now, the bond council letter and I'm totally comfortable that within our debt, we could take on the debt. I don't think anybody questions that. The question is, can we continue to pay for the debt successfully with the taxpayers we have in the city who are getting overburdened every year at an exponential rate? So that is the fundamental question. And that is what Cinder says in her letter that's coming to the council tomorrow that generally the issue is not so much as to whether there's enough debt capacity, but whether there's enough budgetary flexibility to afford the cost without a proposition two and a half debt exclusion of all or part of the project cost. And she can't really speak to that, but we, I just feel that I, as a counselor, have a responsibility back to the taxpayers to be able to answer that if and when they're asking me that. And, and I do think it's a high hurdle for a new mayor to be able to sit down and look at all of that and look out. But I think we've got to try, I mean, we have to look out at least five years and we have to try to look out over the life of it because some things we do know are going to happen. At this point, I just, I'd have to look back at the detail of the projection that came out as to what was included in there. And um, I will do that and hopefully all that stuff is in there. But if I know that you've looked at it and you can say these things that I've been informed of that we are gonna be mandated to do um, are already captured in the projection, I'd feel a lot better about it because it's above my pay grade <laughs> to know that answer. <laughs> but, um, but I feel like I have to have that answer. Okay, thank you. The, so, oh. the good news about the uh, the CSOs and the water department budget, though, is, but bonds are that the revenue to pay for them are not in the general budget. They're in the use, the respective uh, budgets of the water department and the wastewater well, right. treatment plant. Well, right, and I do get that, but it's yeah. all the same people paying it. 
I, no, I understand that too. <laughs> and I was about that to say true. that. That is true. I wasn't trying to re re rebut what you were saying, Councilor Bacon, but so, budget-wise, it's you know it's not apples and oranges. It's all of us uh, paying for it, but it is a little bit separated. Mark Gobo. Uh, yeah, uh, first I just wanted time. To, to bring up that uh, you know if we don't do this phase, we we don't even know what the true cost is, right? It it could actually be less. It, it could be more. Okay. So to get to that next phase of the cost, we, we have to start here. At the same time, I'm sure, um, I know the mayor has talked about putting together capital, uh, a capital a plan that he could be doing in the meantime so we can get a, a, a feel for what that's gonna look like over the next several years. And um, there's no reason why, why both can't happen at the same time so we can get, understand what all those costs are gonna be what the bonding might look like down the road. Um, you know, we do know that uh, inflation happens. The longer we wait, construction is going to cost more. Uh, they're talking about raising uh, interest rates. So the longer we wait, the cost of money is going to cost more. So, you know, I, I feel we all recognize it's, it's a need. And so how do we move forward? You know, how do we get there so we can give the, the big picture of what the cost, the true cost is gonna be. Obviously, that won't be known until we actually get bids in. But to move forward, I think on a recognized need, I, I think you know the step would be to, to go ahead and uh, approve this to just show that the MSBA, that the city is serious about looking at moving forward on this project. And I would, you know, one of the things that frightened me a few years ago was what would happen if, if something happened at Peck, which is old and has very old antiquated systems. And the, I think the MSBA was pretty clear. You're on the hook for 100% of that. We're not funding a nickel of rehab. And you're talking upwards of $80 million. So instead of $30 million for our portion, it's 80 million of a, of a rehab. That, looking at the risk of what we have in the city, that frightened me the most. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number one, Mayor Garcia. And I was, I, so I was just gonna add that I think the anticipated construction, the anticipated start time of the project is what, five, six years from now, was it, more or less? Can you, do you remember? The completion five. forward if 2026 yeah. would be uh, at best when would the project start yeah oh that well that's when it would be completed which if you work back from there generally it's a couple years for construction and that would put you yeah. into 2023 2024. so i think what was what i think i know what was presented to us was that there are a combination of uh new growth um debt that's rolling off that offers um, uh, that flexibility. Um, uh, there's a point behind this to Councilor Vankett's uh, point about absorbing it in our existing, what's the point I'm trying to make here? Okay, um, the project is, is anticipating start in a couple, maybe two fiscal years from now or so. So I think between now and then, just so you guys know, I did. I have been talking with the Department of Revenue this spring. They're offering technical assistance to help with financial forecasting, a, a, an actual tool that has, um, you know, every um, relevant uh, circumstance that might that can happen that allows you to just kind of populate the data accordingly, and it tells you, you know, here's what it looks like, what your budget can potentially look like with um, uh, pay raise increases of 3% or 2.5% or with inflation or, so I think, you know, between now and the start of this project for when we actually have to secure the funds to, to implement construction, we're gonna have to do what, he can, what we can to do a couple of things. One, understand the forecasting situation and also number two, maximize every revenue potential we can free up space in our capacity so that we can afford to, to, to make these payments accordingly. So that means we're gonna have to, as we put the next two budgets together, we'd have to do some, we have to be reserved um, 
uh, ourselves, like either whether if it's making sure we're not, to Jordan's point, not taking on additional bonds for, for projects to, you know, if there is some flexibility in, 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 in the anticipated uh, revenue for next year when we put our budget together, if we can put X amount specifically uh, to a stabilization, specifically to commit toward the project, to defray the costs more, to avoid having to borrow more. Between now and the next two years, I think we're gonna have to just keep our, put our heads together and make sure that we're, we're being mindful of the, the cost that's coming down the pipeline and, and our ability to sustain it within our own appropriation so that we are not borrowing to cover these costs, if that makes sense. So it's, and it's, it's stuff that it's still working on and we're gonna have to work together through it. Um, uh, but I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm with you. I don't disagree on that front at all. And the school, school building committee chair, Aaron Burnell. Thank you, Councilor McGivern. I just wanted to comment and say how much I appreciate your comments on saying that like we really can't afford not to do this and the time is now. When I was reflecting on our last meeting and deciding like my thoughts for this meeting, I, I kept going back to Councilor Jordan's comment about how people are, you know, fleeing the district by their bootstraps. People are strapping on their boots and they're leaving the district. And I can't help but think about how so many city councilors, I'm not saying Mr. Jordan, so many city councilors, when they were running in this past um, election cycle, made a comment in their, in their marketing material about how they wanted to see us getting our schools back from receivership. Well, let me tell you, they're watching. The, the commissioner is watching, the government is watching, and the biggest thing that's gonna aid us in getting back our schools is unity throughout the city as a whole and supporting our youth. And we have been kicking the can for far too many years to do what is best ultimately for our students here in Hoyle. I know like personally, I wouldn't want my child to attend the Pike Middle School. It's just not in great condition. So I just feel like we, you know, when we look at surrounding communities, almost every surrounding community has a new school. So I can just see that as being one of the reasons why some students might leave. Um, and I just wanted to also, excuse me, re reiterate the point that while I absolutely a thousand percent appreciate all the focus on whether or not the end bond will be feasible, right now we need to vote to approve the feasibility study so that way we can do all of the work necessary to get us to the point where we're going to be requesting the bond. Um, I also would like to point out that if we could possibly get this through subcommittee tonight and into this full city council possibly tomorrow, as discussed at the last meeting, the MSBA is meeting in March and they're going to be discussing whether or not to bring the Hoyoke Schools uh, design project as possibly being able to do um, a model school. And as part of that discussion, they're gonna discuss whether or not if we do do a model school, if they would consider reimbursing us for some of the feasibility study. And I just feel like it would be really great if at that meeting, they'll already know, hey, City Council, Hoyle, they've got their funds in order, they're on top of it, they're doing everything they need to do to be ready. So why not let them do a model school and why not agree to reimburse some of the feasibility study, seeing as they're beating their deadlines and getting everything accomplished that we've requested of them. So I just think that it's gonna show really strong community support as a whole for this project if we can move this along and show the MSBA that we're serious and we're ready. And like Mr. Soto said, we would not have even entered into this process again if Cinder wasn't able to provide at least some sort of financial outlook on the health of, of the bond capacity for the city. So I would just like to encourage you guys all to highly consider not tabling this again tonight and getting this to a vote and over to the city council. So that way, hopefully we can be in their March meeting. Um, I do have comments on the next two agenda items, but you know, we'll get there next. I'm hoping, Aaron, that we do get to the next couple of items because that's our goal here is to get through uh, as much as we can tonight. There's about two or three other questions. Did you want to go through them or? We're going to go to item, item answer to item two, right? <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> um, question two was that the provider proof that Hoya Public Schools can contribute that half a million dollars annual that was talked about the first go around to help pay for the depth of the middle school during the life of the bond. Who would like to uh, take this one on? Again. To our superintendent, um, Anthony Soto. 
Yeah, so uh, in, in the letter that uh, we sent to the uh, finance subcommittee, um, Josh and I, Mayor Garcia and I wrote a letter to the commissioner explaining the methodology for which uh, we would be able to come up with uh, $500,000 and um, included in that letter, we also provided a link from the commissioner saying that he agrees with the methodology so long as we move forward and um, get a new school. So the same request that was made of us the first time around um, when, you know, be, uh, d during the last round of this project, when we were committing to a million dollars, uh, we, we provided this, the same exact methodology and the same exact artifacts for, uh, for the council. Uh, just reflecting this $500,000 instead of the million dollars, uh, which included a letter from the commissioner uh, saying that uh, he supports uh, the methodology. If I could add to that as well, um, I spoke to Mildred Lefebvre and we are going to be drafting a letter uh, from the school committee's perspective and supporting that um, post receivership. Um, and she's going to have that drafted and hopefully available to the school committee to um, at our next meeting in February to be able to vote on that. So, you know, of course, that's not. We'll do our best to ensure it, but, you know, we can't guarantee in 10 years that somebody else might change that. But at least the school committee can do their part to ensure that post receivership, once we have control over our school committee's budget, uh, school district's budget again, that we will ensure that that money um, stays on track. Thank you. Councilor Jardine. Yeah, I, I feel comfortable with these assurances. Um, I, I thank um, particularly uh, school committee member Brunel for her comments, because I was gonna actually ask that, so that, that was good. Um, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Soto and Mr. Riley for making that. Again, putting these commitments in writing, they're here for posterity, agreed. Some school committee 10 years from now might do something else. All we can do is put as much protection for the people now. And I think you've, I think you've covered item two. I think you've done as much as you can with this. This makes me feel comfortable, item number two. So thank you for that response on that question. Thank you, Councilor. Is there any further discussion on this item? Question answered. Thank you. The uh, third question, response. Yeah, I, I, I can take this one as well. Thank you, if, if you could. It's not really, I think it's, well, go ahead. It's about the MSBA and the model school. Yeah. Right. We uh, at the last meeting, we were, um, you know, we had uh, brought up that there's potential for us to uh, explore another option that may or may not be cheaper. But we want to make sure we rule out any other option that would be cheaper to um, to what we end up going. So uh, we've been in, in conversation with the MSBA about exploring the model school process. Um, they're looking to take that up at the March meeting, like uh, Ms. Brunel uh, mentioned. Um, and I think the request here was to just get more information on it. So we've included a link to the program itself. Um, and uh, the, the analysis that we had is inconclusive. So we looked at, uh, we looked at all the data. We know that 11% of, of districts that are doing new construction explore this model school problem uh, process. We know that there were three model school designs available on MSBA's website that were middle schools, but uh, the last one was built about 10 years ago. Um, so th there was nothing recent and like size for us to do a, a thorough comparison of costs. Um, we did look at, you know, on their website, they have a list of all of the projects and we were able to calculate um, what the average cost is for you know the model schools that have been built, um, and I think that that was about five hundred and fifty-five dollars per square foot, which the, the design that we had for Peck initially was about five twenty-two. Um, we also looked at 
the more recent projects that are in the pipeline uh, with the MSBA and what the costs are per square foot. And, you know, we noted the average cost per square foot is about 605 based on the, the more recent projects that they have. Um, but that's not just model schools. So um, we provided all of the information. We do know that that any if we do explore the model school option, it, it, it is going to definitely require some significant um, design tweaks, right? Um, you know, the three model schools that that they have online uh, or the, the designs they have are for 715 students, 900 students or 1100 students. So we're looking to build a new middle school for, for 550 students. So out the gate, you know, there would have to be some tweaks made to that um, to that model school uh, design. And we also know that um, PEX, PEX sits on a grade that's about 40 feet uh, from 40 feet to about 20 feet side to side. So that, that would require some major modifications to uh, the model school design. Um, all this is really to say that, that, you know, we as a building committee and as a school department are committed to exploring all possible ways to make sure that um, this project is, is cost effective and that we're, you know, I don't want to leave any stone unturned in terms of, of savings. Now I will say, you know, I don't want to compromise, you know, the level of quality that we're, you know, bringing to our students in terms of educational programming. So we, you know, we ultimately we have the students in mind in every decision that we make, but I don't want the, I don't want any counselor or any uh, uh, member of, of this community to be able to say, hey, how come you guys didn't look at the model school process? maybe there was opportunity to save money there. I want to be able to say we looked at it and in fact, the design that we have tweaked and updated is cheaper than going the model school route. Um, but the, the good thing about moving forward with the model school route is that there is potential that the, the uh, and, I, and I know Ms. Ms. Brunel mentioned it earlier, there is potential for the MSBA to what they call participate, meaning like they'll give us uh, the you know eighty percent reimbursement for the, the the feasibility study portion of of this project if we participate. Um, so I'm, I was hope I was hoping that with all the information we provided, there were links to to the website, history of the program, um, a list of schools and a, a bunch of information that we provided um, in that memo. Uh, I was hoping that this, this order was complied with in terms of request number three. Thank you, Mr. Soto. And um, Anthony, I think you mentioned one of the model schools in the area, one design used was West Springfield, is that correct? Yeah, the West Springfield High School actually. Um, I, Russell Johnson, I think was a superintendent at the time. Okay. I, I've been in West Springfield High School on a number of occasions, and it, it's a well-designed and, uh, I think, a great functioning yeah. uh, building. Is there any questions on, on this question response? I just have one. Councilor Bacon? Um, I would just like to know from our superintendent what your personal opinion is relative to the model school concept. I mean, is it a concept that you think is good, or do you think it's a concept that's more one size fits all kind of thing. And you're, um, I'm getting I, my, a, a little, I'm just interested to know because I, I'm yeah. getting a bit of an impression and I just want to, <laughs> I don't want to make an assumption. No, I, I hope I'm not leaning to any impression. I, uh, to, to counselor McGiver's point, I've seen, West Springfield High School, and I think it's a beautiful school. Um, and 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 I'm sure there are model schools out there that are beautiful. What I don't want to what I what I don't want to suggest to the council is that we're going to go down this path, and that the model school is definitely going to save us money. I you know I have reservations with saying that based on the information that I saw, you know. Um, but like 
what I'm committed to doing is exploring that if there is a possible way that we can save the city funding on this project without compromising, you know, educational programming and our educational plan. Um, so I, I am indifferent. I really, uh, you know, what's most important to me is that we're able to carry out our educational plan and that our students get a new building that they deserve um, so that we can move forward. Um, so whether that's a model school way or using the existing design that we have, which was beautiful as well, um, I'm indifferent. I, I, I think that the, the, the building committee is committed to exploring both of those options. And at the end of the day, choosing the option that's number one, best for students, and number two, uh, you know, uh, financially feasible. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Aiken. Is there any other questions or discussion on this item? Seeing none. Item number four, the uh, question was to, request was to provide documentation of the responsibility of the owner's project manager, known as the OPM and designer, and, and that, that led the school build, building committee to recommend the $475,000 request. Yeah, I'd be happy to walk through that uh, re response as well. Um, this response was provided to the school building committee back on December um, 2nd. Uh, we, we got a letter from um, both the OPM and the designer that we used uh, that breaks out the 475,000. Um, the majority of that cost would be the designer, uh, the designer fees. And in that letter, you can see um, anyone who's clicked into it and read the details, it's time. You know, there's a, a, a phase of the process, you know, that, that takes two months time where they facilitate two citywide forums, one in person and one via Zoom. Um, there's a, a ton of you know, research that they have to do. Uh, you know, the cost of, of construction is way different. I think one, one thing that I've, you know, that Whitney and I and, and Aaron looking on the MSBA's website, you can see how, how drastic the construction costs have changed between 2019 and, and now, um, you know, like th there's a lot of work that goes into being able to put a piece of paper in front of the city council and say, hey, your project is gonna cost $74 million. Um, and the design portion of it is, is a, a very long process. So um, the, the letter lays out in a little more detail uh, what makes up the 475, but this chart here shows you that the designer estimate is 265,000 as compared to in the you know initially when we did this project i believe it was 528,000 um please don't hold on give me let me quickly look at that um yes yes and then, um, you know, they, they are recommending that a traffic study be done for $16,000. And then the OPM itself would be about $143,000. Um, and uh, should we ask for, you know, a second estimate or another entity, it's another $26,000. And then there's $25,000 built into to there for, you know, um, you know that, that doesn't necessarily have you know, we, that, that's just a, a buffer per se, the $25,000. Thank you, Superintendent. Any questions? Uh, I, I did. Councilor Jordan. Um, does anyone recall what the feasibility study cost from two years ago was? It was about 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. 80% reimbursal. Right. Yeah. So we got, so obviously that becomes somewhat less contentious because 80% of it was reimbursed. So we were on the hook for, say, 240000 Yes. Okay. Yes. 
So even though this number is much smaller, it's double what we had to pay the last time. Because this doesn't double get assuming, It's double assuming no reimbursement. Okay. But as I mentioned earlier, if we go the, if we move forward the, um, you know, the, they're going to take it up on their, in their March meeting, um, they would participate in, in the feasibility portion. So, you know, assuming, assuming the feasibility study costs 475 and the board in the, the board in March approves that, um, then, you know, they would be, they would be reimbursing, uh, 80% of this. And, also, Josh had mentioned earlier that there's other, you know, he, he's in looking into whether or not CDBG could cover this um, or another funding source. Uh, Mr. Soto, can you go over that again? I want to understand the comment you just made about they might be willing to fund this at 80%. Can, can you go through the yeah, rationale? So of traditionally, that? traditionally, like when, when you're, when you go through a failed vote and then you get approved to, First of all, you normally don't get approved to come back in right away like we did. But um, since the city council unanimously, um, you know, uh, voted on a resolution that they've reviewed the finances and they're ready to move forward, the, the MSBA felt comfortable and, and felt like there was unity here and, and that we could get this done. So they've invited us back in. But uh, normally when you're invited in after a failed vote, the, they won't cover the feasibility study costs. So um, what the conversation that uh, the mayor and I had had with uh, Jack from the MSPA was that, you know, um, if we explore the, the, um, the model school route, um, that there's a, there's a possibility that he can convince the board to participate in the feasibility cost of, of the project should we go oh, that route. I mean, the MSBA does, they they do want, they want to uh, uh, communities to participate in in model school pro projects because they, you know, they did a, a lot of the heavy lifting and creating designs that generally work and, um, you know, are, are relatively inexpensive or are relatively cheaper than other projects. So. Um, they have a vested interest in, you know, just like we're trying to make sure we're saving money for the great citizens of Holyoke and doing our due diligence. The MSBA has a vested interest in making sure that, you know, they're putting every step forward and making sure that the, the residents of the state are, are getting, you know, their money's worth. So there's a there's a, you know, this they've agreed that if we move forward with this route, there's a chance that he can get the board to approve participating in the feasibility process. Oh, that, that's fantastic. So, um, did, have we, I don't know, Whitney, if maybe you have on the difference between like tw 2019, what we did and what was the model school footage rate on average? I saw it, was it, did I, am I reading this correctly? Yeah, that, it, that, it wouldn't support. Um, so, we looked at the average cost of the model school, but many of them were, many of them were built so long ago that, you know, Whitney was even hesitant to put these numbers out here because they were built so long ago. Um, but I just, you know, I just said, look, we need to, we need to just like, let's take the average cost of the model school building. Um, and what we saw was that they were the average cost was about five hundred and fifty-five per square foot. Okay, which Ver more, versus um, which more than the five twenty-two of the PEC design. So, so it was more expensive than to the, do our original average. The average cost that we're seeing on projects that um, that have used this process was about 555. Now, I will say that the MSBA looked at the model school design and, you know, they, they put it, had a team together and looked at it and, and they said, Hey, there's potential here to save some money. So I, you know, I, I hope they're right. But again, like I want to explore it. I want to be able to say, Hey, we, we looked under that stone and it saved us money or we looked under it and you know what? The, the route of going with our old design 
is is actually cheaper. You know, I, that that would be my goal in terms of exploring the model design. If it doesn't save money, then why would we do it? We already have a design that that right. you know fits our site, meets our educational programming. Um, why would we explore that? The right. only reason I would explore right. the model school design is or, and move forward with it is if it if it's significantly cheaper for the the for Holyoke. Right. I think I think that makes perfect sense. Um, so on this whole thing about the 475, um, using our ARPA money or using the CDBG doesn't necessarily make me feel warm and fuzzy about the 475 because that's money we would otherwise spend that would be available to us. It's yep. all it's all kind of one pot. Now, if they were to cover the 80 percent of it, that would make me feel good um, because that's less of a risk to us. See, because essentially why I'm so, and it somewhat comes back to item one again, I don't want to just throw 475 out the door. We bet on a gamble. Then they come in and they say, yep, we're, we're on board. And then we come back a year from now or whenever that approval is. I think there was a timeline kicked around in January 10th meeting. And then we say, well, you know, we ran that we crunched the numbers. Now we can't safely afford this. And then now we're out four hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Okay, that's we're in a position where we can't just throw away four hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars of the of the people's money. We and what concerns me even more about that is that it's so like uh, you know tight that even becomes more of a red flag to me because it's like, if it's there, if it's like, Hey, it could go either way or I'm not sure. And, and everybody's sort of backing up and we're okay this year, but three years from now, you know, it could be a different whole story. Forget 30 years. We're talking three years, you know, uh, and, and to, to Mark, who's always, a voice of reason on all these things, and I know is a strong supporter of this, and I wanted to, I want to get behind this. We should be able to do a back an analysis that puts in assumptions, right? That at 59% reimbursement, which I think is what's being told to us here at the last meeting, if that went up to we got 65%, or maybe if we did it at 50 and the num and the bond payment went from a million to two million. You know, whatever those assumptions are, these are just numbers, right? It, it's, it's, you should be able to punch those in and say, I reasonably forecast we're good over the reasonable horizon. And if people can at least give the council that assurance, we've done our job. You know, we can say to the public, yes, I supported a school, but I also supported a school you can afford. And that this is going to also meet we're going to meet the educational priorities. We're going to meet the police, the DPW, the fire, all these important priorities. I would love to have a new school. Again, back in the old days, these school votes were no-brainer easies because everything was 90% funded, like Hoyok High School. That was only 2011, right? Um, there was a mistake there later made as to why we didn't get 90% on the second half because we didn't put in the whole proposal. That, that's a subject that's been explored at some length. But in the old days, we would get big reimbursements, no problem, you know, whatever you wanted to do. Now, when it's bigger ticket items and this is 50-50 split and you're tapped out of money, it, that's why I want to make sure that that, I don't want to just vote for 475 unless I have those reasonable assurances, but the notion that we could maybe get some of this reimbursed, um, maybe you guys can work out some sort of plan to to look, look through these numbers and make the case to the, the finance committee to say, you know what, this is a good investment of the 475 um, to do this, and we can, if they said yes, we could afford it. So that, that's, that's all I'm looking for at this point. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, counselor, I, I think that's what 
that's what Cinder's analysis does. I'm trying to figure out what more, um, you know, what what more assurance Cinder, you know, Cinder and and her team, Hilltop Securities, mm-hmm. they did a whole debt schedule analysis, and you know, I think the mayor was pretty clear that he's not willing to, um, you know, what. I, you, you, Talk about what could happen in three years. Yeah, the, the PEC building could need to be replaced in three years to Mark Lubold's point, and we would be on the hook for 100% of that cost, right? Cinder um, send, send builds, Mr. Soto, to answer your question, what's the problem with Cinder's analysis? She builds caveats into it that says, you know, absent you doing something else, I can't speak to your budget. She puts all these different caveats to wiggle it out. But let me ask you a question. Yeah. Would you, for sure. your family, sign on to a 30-year mortgage if you could not know three years into it that you could afford the mortgage payment? Would you sign the note to take a 30-year mortgage on your house if you didn't know three years ago, three years later, you could make the payment? Yes or no? Uh, if I had talked to my accountant and, I, my, you know, if I had looked at my books and did a whole projection of how much finances I have. Yeah, I would say, yeah. I mean. The, the, the forecasting uh, counselor, I'm with you on the forecasting and that's something, that's a heavy lifting that I explained that we're gonna be working on in the spring. Not gonna, what if nothing else gets on the agenda of those that we're gonna be working with. Uh, but certainly, um, and, and you know, I did go out to, to, to Boston over the weekend and, and, and met up had a couple of meetings with some folks out there, one of which was a member of the Department of Revenue where I explained that the forecasting is a necessary tool that we need so that we can plug in numbers and understand three years, five years, even 10 years. Um, We don't do that at all here in the city. And it's not anything that I can just whip up in a day. Um, About uh, two months. Well, I need the, the experts that know how to do that level of work and they're not available till the spring to help us start that level of work. And it won't be on time for this particular project, but I do wholeheartedly, I, I, I right now understand where you're coming from versus, I think what you're asking for is re- it's, it's a very responsible and reasonable thing. Um, just in general, not just the schools, but I think in anything that we do, you can even forecast out what, like I said earlier, what uh, what salary increases would look like, right? Like. Yeah. It's, it's a really neat tool. It's something that in a micro level, I worked with Department of Revenue that we brought to Blanford um, that really helped uh, in a big way and, and something that I, that, that I mean, actually every community should be doing. Um, uh, you know, so I'm not against you on that front. We need that. I just don't think we'll have that on time for this particular project. Just, uh, Councilor Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I really want to vote for this. I, I really do. And I, I think we, we brought up the Cinder uh, letter a couple of times, and I think it's really important we kind of break that letter down further so we can get some of these answers maybe. And we were having a good discussion about it before in the Finance Subcommittee, and I think it's really important to, at least to help me come to, come to a good decision tonight, at least to continue that conversation. Uh, so we were crunching some of the numbers, and one of the, let's see, I, I've got $118 million as the total the total debt forecast. What, what's the word? The, the total amount we can bond for. So that's $118 million. That's 5% of the total property valuation. I think it's something like $2 billion, which is huge. Um, so I think I've got, what, $79 million as we ha- is what we have on the books now. And somebody feel free to stop me if I'm, if I'm saying crazy numbers. So I want to make sure we get this right. And I've got $37 million is, is maybe, what, what's the estimation? Maybe the receiver or Aaron, the mayor, somebody could help me out with an estimation for the school costs. What is it, like 30, 35 million after all said reimbursements, everything said and done, what we would be responsible for? Yeah, the, on on the analysis that was done by Cinder, it was twenty nine and a half. I believe twenty nine and a half. Thirty million. Yeah, let's round with thirty. Would be our port. Would be the the city's portion. 
So I got my Apple Watch here. So 79. 79 plus 30. That puts us at 109. So what is that? Uh, 11, say 8, 8 million dollars left over to be able to bond. Mm -hmm. And that would be what over. So if the if we're paying this bond off, what is it? 1.3 million dollars every year. Yep. So we would be subtracting 1.3 million dollars from that total every year until we get to zero, essentially, to pay off the bond. I mean, that just that's that's tough, and and it's not an easy decision to make. I just want everybody to understand. I mean, this is a millions and millions of dollars, and, and I'm trying to think if something were to happen and we needed a bond for ten, eleven, twelve million dollars, and we're over that, what that process looks like, and what that means for the city. So now we need an override for something like that. I mean, that's kind of that's tough to ask to support. So just want everybody yeah. to keep in mind while you know while we're talking about the school the children i said this at the last meeting you know i remember going to walk into McHugh to learn to speak english so i get it you know with my little mesh nylon backpack and knee deep snow i get it it's just really tough to ask to support uh, a possible override and I'm, I'm looking at the wiggle room there and 10 8, eight million dollars over i mean if, if we start paying this off and then what, what are we looking at maybe five ten 10 years before this looks like a like an acceptable bond and even then we're still around like what 75 percent 80 percent it's really high so i don't know i'm just trying to i'm trying to kind of wrap my head around this where's the override i i mean we're not talking about an override right now so, right so I, that, that's what so the the point is uh, the number one question wasn't answered the request number one so i'm kind of trying to answer it for us um so i'm, I'm kind of projecting out if if we're at nine million dollars left over from our 118 million dollar bond capacity or eight million dollars i mean that's really high am i am i doing that calculation wrong experienced counselors please help me out no. counselor tallman counselor mcgivern you would be at a hundred and a hundred and what a hundred and something million dollars yeah that's high yeah i, I, I don't I know, know i'm you but that's high i don't know if that comes into effect i think we heard the, the mayor talk tonight um that there's some debt coming off and there's also new growth in the next few years. So that, that's a big offset. I, I know we don't, we can't project what's going to happen down the road as far as new fire truck, uh, police cars, uh, that's going to be a cost, um, you know, and the revenue coming in. But if there is, you know, if there is some revenue coming in and there is things coming off the debt, off our debt capacity, I mean, that's something that we got to look at too. So it's not like they're going to be really close, but it is something to be concerned about. Yeah. Suggestion. We have Cinder, have Cinder Is there a chance I could respond to Councilor Puelo's? Um, absolutely. Quick. The chair. It's good to see you, Aaron. Good. Will the chair recognize uh, Aaron Linville? Hi. Thanks all. Sorry, I'm sick um, for my throat, but I guess I was looking at it a little differently, which might be might help some people. I don't know. This way is a little bit easier for me to understand. Is I look at like our existing. Um, like deck capacity, looking at the that PEX schedule that Cinder gave us, and we're right around like this year, fiscal year 2021 was 4.8 million. Like the highest point getting paying for a new school is is right under 1.9. So I guess I was kind of thinking of it as we are that's like less than 50 percent of our available capacity for bonding would be spent on on the middle school. So then for me, it's like, do the other needs of the city, can they fit within that 4.8 minus 1.9, which is 3 million, million, right? So isn't there like $3 million left per year to pay for other things? And um, if we were to do 1.8 million per year for the school, for 1.9 million, I guess I just thought thinking of it as kind of on an annual basis this was like an easy or way for me personally to understand it. So I wasn't sure if that maybe helped other people think about it differently. I can screen share if it's helpful to look at the PEC thing. And obviously I'll make sure you guys all have this again. I can send it um, tonight. Yeah. So just for clarification, Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, I guess the way the numbers look is for the first couple of years, I mean, we would, we wouldn't really have too much flexibility. We would eventually, cause we're, we're paying that off and we're moving down. But I guess for the first couple of years, it'd be a little tight. Yeah, I do think it's tight for the first five years. I do also think, though, when I looked at what Cinder 
propose, there does seem to be flexibility where the earlier bond payments are a lower amount and we pay more later on. So I wonder if to be more conservative for the rest of the city, do we propose a little bit smaller payments like 1.3 million or something in the early years, knowing we'll just have to pay a little bit more. And, and then through that, all, all the time, this, this schools could still contribute the half a million. What I've just been talking about doesn't include the half a million per year from the schools. Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah, Councilor Poole, are you all set? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Kevin, can you hang on a second? Yeah, sure. Councilor Israel Rivera. Uh, 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 Chairman McGivern, uh, Councilor McGivern, thank you. Um, I guess my questions are around, damn, baby, I was just coloring that. Why do you do that? Anyways, um, so my questions are around more or less like this right now, what's up for vote is for the feasibility uh, study to go to the larger council so that we can vote on feasibility dollars, right? Yes. Yeah. In a nutshell, yes. Like, I'm only asking because there's a lot of different conversations about a, a lot of different steps in the process that we are not at yet. So to me, it's starting to get like muddled up with regards to what the what we're trying to do right now in this particular moment. I have a lot of concerns myself with the future steps and all the things that are going to be happening in the, in, the, in the steps in the future. But right now, for me, I guess, I, if we are all in agreement with regards to wanting to build the school or at least getting the feasibility <coughs> done, then I, I feel like we should try to move this forward so that we can get into the next step and the next process. And then we can actually ask the questions that we have with those with the next processes, because a lot of it sounds like the questions that a lot of people have and the concerns come a little further down uh, down the road. Um, that's just what I, my observation. Thank you, Councilor Rivera. Um, just Aaron, do you have your hand back up? Aaron uh, Glenville. No, sorry. No, no, that's okay. Sure. It's 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 the. Uh, the fun product of Zoom is hands go up and down, and I can never tell if they've been upward. They just came back up. But I appreciate it. And I appreciate your, your speaking out. If you could share that with, uh, with Jeff, you know, he'll get it to all of us, the, uh, the document you're talking about. But your comments were well taken, and I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of, of housekeeping. We've gone through the four questions and responses, also with the public schools response we had, as asked, the uh, link and the uh, copy to the minutes of all the, uh, sub, of all the uh, school committee board uh, meetings themselves. Aaron, I know you did meet tonight, but uh, to date, it goes through January 13th, what we received. We've talked a lot about Cinder McNary, our bond council tonight. We received, as asked, through our auditor and treasurer, who both were at our last meeting, uh, responses from Cinder. Um, those, those numbers have been kicked around a lot tonight by uh, just, moment, just the last few moments, but also earlier. And um, we've also received, um, I, think, I think that, besides the comments this evening, I think we, that, that's the, uh, to date what we've received. So with that in mind, if there's no other documentation or comments from the building committee or the mayor, I look to the committee as to what our next step might be. Mm -hmm. Councilor Jordan. I, I have, a, I have a, some, certainly some suggestions on that front. I, I did want to just clarify one point is 4.8 is not the bond capacity. 4.8 is, according to Cinder, the current bill that we're paying. And she's projecting that the 1.3, that there would be enough coming off the 4.8 that would cover um, the 1.3 so that you'd stay around 4.8, 4.9 in the early years. Of course, it begs the question of what else is out there um, unknown at this point. Would like to have um, Cinder come in, give us some additional, uh, I'd like to have an, I've never had an opportunity to I, qu question her to come in. Would you? Is, is Tanya still on? Tanya is still on. Um, in her email, Cinder has indicated 
She yeah. would have been with us this evening, except she has a her own uh, school finance committee from her town. She, she gave us an S car, ACE card today, so I'm just wondering if I could, if we can pull that, Tanya. You think uh, we can give Cinder a call and see if she'll pick up? <laughs> well, I would kind of I personally. Only have her yeah. Tanya, go ahead. It's 10 o'clock at night. But. I said I only have her email. I could um, send her a quick email if you like. Okay, hang, hang on a second. Mayor, I, I, I love you, but... Not all of us here are retired, including yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it is 10 o'clock. And, and I, I, every time, I love listening to Cinder. <laughs> every, every time I've sat with Cinder, it's, it's just, you know, alone. She did get an hour conversation. She was like, if you want me to call it, just call me and she'll stop. I, no, I know. I know. And I'm sure her, her other committee meeting in her town is over with. But I, I think, let's, let's talk this out for a second. But yeah. Thanks, Tanya. But hang on a minute. I, I would like uh, to, because I think... We don't need to spend too much time on, you know, I think we're all in favor of, you know, if we can afford this, let's do this. It's, it's not that kind of conversation. It's more of let's crunch the numbers, have the mayor, have, um, you know, we've got the assurances. The school committee is going to do their part in the, in the superintendent um, to have Cinder, to have Tanya, to have the mayor. And let's have a roll up our sleeves finance conversation at our next finance meeting. And if uh, we can go through the numbers and, uh, you know, uh, let's, let's, let's dig into this and uh, let's see if we can get our arms around it and have that conversation. And uh, hopefully we can, we can put the financial piece to bed um, and, and move forward from there. Councilor Dahlman? Yeah, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I understand the concerns and um, I think this part is a feasibility study is just trying to find out what we can afford and what we can do. Um, I, I think we heard a lot tonight. I think all our questions were answered. Um, I do have concerns. I don't know how things are going to go later on. I, what type of building it's going to be, how much it's going to cost. But this is just getting this to the uh, MSBA, you know, for their March meeting. And, you know, with that, that model building, that model school building possibility coming up at the same time, that there could be a reimbursement of this money. Um, coming uh, w when they have their meeting in March. So um, I, I think we discussed this a lot tonight. I think all the questions that we had at the last finance meeting were, were answered adequately. Um, and I, I feel that we should move this forward to the full council tonight. That's my opinion. Uh, it's, it's up to the rest of the council to see how they feel. But um, this, is, this is a time that we have to, to make this move to let them know that we are behind this feasibility study. Who knows what's going to happen down the road if uh, if the full council will vote for a new school if we are are selected to get to the next phase but i think we've decided that uh, we are uh, in favor of uh, looking at the the 475 and i think it's something that um that the city that the council in my opinion uh the finance and not i'm just speaking for myself feels that uh, we should go through with this vote tonight and and bring this to the full council tomorrow evening mr chairman if that's the motion, I'll second it. Councilor Jordan. Yeah, so here's the problem with the logic, and, and I get where people are coming from. Oh, well, you know, this is just a feasibility study, and don't worry about the finances. We, we can deal with that. You know, we'll deal with that, you know, nine months from now, a year from now, or, or whenever we're going to have. Okay, so let's say if we were to agree that that was logical, then that's basically like walking down to MGM and putting, you know, the money on black or red and spinning the wheel. Because basically what you're saying is, I'm going to spend 475 on something we might not be able to afford. And, but, you know, we'll just deal with that decision down the road. On the motion. Like logic, excuse me, we're under discussion. Thank you. And um, so from those of us, that feel that you don't just waste four hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars on something that you can easily feel comfortable about the answer today. I mean, we're talking about having Cinder in. I, I'm just wondering, do we not want those questions asked in public? You know, I wasn't here to ask Cinder. Uh, Councilor Puello wasn't here to ask uh, Cinder those questions. I think we should have a crack at it. I know before, if everybody was unanimous, it was all wonderful. Sounds yeah. like two years ago, when everything was unanimous, until the public said, we're not on board. And I think some of us would like to ask those questions, to have an opportunity 
to say, you know what, this is, and defend it out in public financially and feel comfortable. Or we can just say, eh, pass the 475, and if it don't work out, and we don't vote for the bond, or we can't afford it, and it fails, well, it's only a half a million dollars. The taxpayers will send us some more. Don't worry about it. It's only money. You know, no, 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 that's not the way I vote. I make sure every nickel is spent the right way in advance, and that's the way it should be done if this were my money. I would make sure all questions asked, then I take a vote. Right now it's pass it and we'll get to this down the road. Maybe that's how other people want to vote, that's not how I vote. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Palau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have to agree with Councilor Jernigan on this one. I, I, uh, <laughs> the mayor laughs. Um, you know, I, I think about it, if, if it were my money, I, I definitely wouldn't do it this way. I would make sure that I, uh, that, that I know what I'm going to pay for, what the bill is, and then, and then I pay. I don't go to the restaurant and, and do it otherwise. I get the bill, I, I eat, sit down, eat, pay. Um, but it, maybe, maybe we can get a rundown of what the timeline schedule is again, just so we know. I mean, maybe that'll help our decision tonight. When, when do we need to have this? Just can't wait two weeks. <clears throat> April 29th is the deadline. Two weeks. Oh, if I can answer that for you, I'm sorry. The ultimate deadline would be that the city council needs to approve the funding mechanism by April 27th to meet, um, to have the MSBA uh, vote on this in their meeting in June. So what, what are the ramifications? Like, if we sat on this, what are the, what are the ramifications of it? Because, I mean, I'm sure if, if we were to we'll prove it. in the water, will. Mr. Polo, if What's we that? sit on this, if we don't have a decision by then, we'll be dead in the water. No, well, I mean, if, if we, so my question is maybe, let me rephrase it, maybe sitting on it wasn't the right word to use. If we wait to talk to Cinder, maybe another week or two or whatever the case is, and then it gets approved at the next meeting, are there any real ramifications to us waiting just to get those answers? Because I, I think we'd be able to meet the deadline, approve it here, and then approve it at full council, and then move it on to. That's correct. That's correct. Cool. While that's a deadline, I'm sorry, Mr. McGiver, may I? Yes, yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, thank you. While that is a deadline, that is the ultimate deadline. Any attempts we can do to beat that deadline just increases the time that we have in our feasibility study to obtain all this information. I will again reiterate that the MSBA is meeting in March to discuss whether or not to invite Hoyle Public Schools into the model school model portion of this. And at that meeting, when they decide whether or not to let us look at the model school model, will be when they decide whether or not to allow us to have some reimbursement for this feasibility study. So while I understand counselors' concerns, and to Mr. Jordan's point, which I wasn't a panelist at the time to, to comment on, would you finance a home if you don't know where you'll be in three years? And as a realtor, I can say that people do it every day because you cannot predict if you get laid off, where the economy may go. Nobody could predict a global pandemic. We just simply, and also I wanna reiterate that the bond payments don't start until the school is built. So while I hear your, your, your gentleman's point about this is a little backwards, to Mr. McGivern's point, that's just the way it works. We can't, we can't control the fact that we have to do feasibility before we have all the answers for bonding. So as of right now, this is where we're at and this is the, the step that we're at so you know mayor garcia has offered some alternative funding mechanisms to help offset the cost of feasibility so even if you folks approve this tonight we, you know we may end up finding out that we don't need the money which would be great but we need to show the msba that we're willing and moving forward Cinder did the cost analysis that you're now asking for when we decided to enter the feasibility study so if there was questions about affordability then they should have brought been brought up and i understand we have a new city council now and additional members but we never would have entered the process if we didn't have confidence in the affordability of the project so you know i would love nothing more than to see this advance through through your subcommittee tonight and brought back to the full council tomorrow so that way, at their March meeting, when the MSBA is discussing whether or not Hoyle will be a good candidate for the model school project, and to help encourage them to refund some of the feasibility study, we need to show that as a community that we fully support this project. So I hope that you guys, at least three of you, will advance this to the full city council for tomorrow night's meeting. Thank you, Chair Burnell. Councilor Israel Rivera, is your hand still up or is it back up? 
Uh, it's backed up. Um, so, so for me, just, just, I just kind of want to clarify. It's not that I'm saying to just vote it and then let's figure out the finances after the fact. It's that I'm understanding that this is the way the process is, right? Uh, like, it's just the way it is. Uh, I'm a new counselor, but I do understand processes, and I know that this is the process. Uh, you could try to control it. You could try to uh, manipulate it, uh, do whatever you want, but they're the public administrators that actually have the power and actually kind of write their rules and regulations as to how they want to do things, right? Um, so for me, I guess, yeah, it would be cool to bring Cinder in, and I have not met Cinder either, and it would be cool to meet her too as well. But um, I don't know, I, I guess, what are we going to get different from her that we got from Josh and what we got from Soto and from Aaron? What are they going to say? What is she going to say differently? I mean, I, I, I'm assuming that, that Anthony understands finances, right? And, and, uh, um, and that if Cinder's explaining things with regards to finances, they have a mutual understanding with regards to finances because they both, I think, they went to school for finances, right? That I am assuming that the people that are, are in their roles professionally are doing what they're doing effectively and efficiently. I may be wrong because not everybody does everything effectively and efficiently, but the way of gov government and what I'm learning in my master's program for public policy administration is to entrust in the people that you have hired to do the jobs, right, that they are hired to do. So as a community, this is kind of one of the things that we should do. I do have questions. I have a lot of questions around other things, but this is part of the process. So later on, I can ask my questions. I'm sorry I wasn't there before to ask my questions, but that's just the way it is. I'm, I mean, we could bring her in and I'll have questions for Cinder, but at the end of the day, we're just prolonging something that's just gonna hold it in anyways. That's what it feels like to me. But again, that's just my opinion. Thank you, Councilor Rivera. And if I could just weigh in as the uh, final member of the Finance Committee who hasn't said his piece yet, is, is Councilor Tomlin, you know, said it all. I, I think our questions have been asked and answered, and it's time that we get, we get it forward for the final vote. Councilor Anderson Burgos uh, made the second or made the motion to do that. Councilor Jordan, Councilor Powell asked the questions that, not the four questions that we went into detail tonight, but those um, around our bond council's response to what we had asked through our city auditor and our city treasurer, which is the two major main people in the city of Hoyle who work with the mayor on working with bond council. Um, I, for one, know and, and am comfortable with the response that we received from Cinder McNary, but I also know that she has a lot to offer. And for that reason, I, I'm tending to leaning towards keeping this for one more meeting to see if we can bring Cinder in to be able to have a round table discussion with her. But there's a second reason that, I, that I'm leaning towards that. And it's, you know, Aaron Burnell makes a, makes a strong argument. We, we could probably pass this tomorrow night. We need nine votes. If it goes tomorrow night, I'll predict right now, the vote would be nine to four. That's not the message I wanna send to the MSBA. I wanna send a message to the MSBA the city council voted 13 and nothing in favor of this project feasibility study going forward. So with that in mind, I think it's fair for the four counselors that are asking to listen to Cinder that we do one more meeting and, and have, uh, and she is going to do it Zoom, so I, I, I trust we can set it up as quickly as possible. Um, the finance committee, you saw tonight, everybody, we had our just our police department and our Veterans, Veteran Affairs Department in. I have six items already in committee with the Department of Public Works that have been pending for over a month, and we have a lot coming in from the mayor tomorrow night and from our auditor. And we are keeping busy, but we will always make time for this very important subject. So I will work with the auditor and uh, with Cinder to find a convenient and uh, um, schedule so we can all meet with her and uh, see if we can get the final answer. Does anybody want to comment on my comment? Just first of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we have an old rule around here that when people want to ask questions, we let them ask the questions and uh, we're an open book. You, you once again uphold that. I appreciate it. Um, I think when, when, you know, this is, 
this has been kicked around for a few years and it's contentious by nature. Everybody has strong opinions. I appreciate that. I think people will see we should try to sh shoot for as much unity as we can on this uh, within reason, and I'll certainly do my part for that. I look forward to having Cinder in. If we could get the reports, maybe we can put these concerns to bed at the next meeting, but I don't see why we can't have this out of finance in two weeks. Thank you. I'm not going to promise two weeks, <laughs> just so everybody knows. Might be a month. We, we right. have only because of what we have in front of us. Okay, well, you're the boss of that. No, no, it's just, it's yeah. not that. It's just I have to juggle the, the whole thing. You That's do all. What you think is best. Um, any other thoughts before we make the motion? Councilor Talman. No, I, I agree. Uh, I, I'm glad the chairman brought that up. I, I, I would have loved to move this forward tonight um, with the full council, but I, as, as Council McGivern said, I'd. Uh, it's better to have unanimous support for this. Uh, I think it's important for our new councilors, especially to have Cinder in and get some really uh, di good dialogue about this issue and, and some of the other questions we still have. I, I'm really appreciative of the school building committee that really answered all our questions uh, adequately. Um, and, and by no means am I somebody that wants to throw around $475,000 in, in taxpayer dollars. I just think this is something, this is the next step as uh, Councilor Rivera stated. It's a process that we got to go through, and it's something that uh, I think uh, is well thought out. I think it's better to have all the colleagues, all my colleagues on board with this uh, and get a unanimous uh, vote through. So I'm, I'm willing. I just hope it doesn't take two months and we get behind the eight ball where we're sort of rushing through this. Um, hopefully we can get this on uh, one of the future uh, finance agenda meetings because I know we have a lot uh, to, to really go through next uh, next couple of meetings. So whatever the a chairman can do to, to sort of move this along um, and, and get the, uh, the proper people in there to answer our questions, I think is, uh, is important. I've been to, uh, with a city delegation to Wall Street, to Moody's, to argue our bond rating twice with Cinder. Trust me, this will be a good meeting. You'll all enjoy meeting yes. with her and uh, we'll make it as quick as possible, but she is fascinating. I just, uh, I think it's incredible that we still have her and health top securities as our bond council. So is there anything else not to disappoint anyone, but I think the uh, votes are here. So I'll make a motion to table the- uh, Motion uh, made and second to table so we can have Sin McNary in. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, so moved. Um, so we'll get a table, both these items, yep. both these items, the second 11. item is just- 10 and 11. Yeah. And then item 12 is just housekeeping. Um, Jeff thought it was something that we had not acted on. It was actually a communication that came separately for an item that we already acted on. So that's item number 12. What would you like, what would you like us Counselor? to do? What item? Uh, to our Jeffrey. Counselor, can I, can I clarify? Yes. Yeah. So the, the ordinance committee actually needs to consider this and so the, the request was just a copy to the ordinance committee so that they consider it, it can what, consider it as part of the discussion. How about we just team. refer, if this is the send original, why don't we just refer the whole thing to ordinance? To send it over, right. Yeah, I'll, I'll make okay. that motion, Mr. Motion made a second to refer item 12 to the committee on ordinance, according okay. to Councilor Jordan. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Let's make that, well, I think you heard what we got pending. So um, to your answers about the next, the next scheduled meeting, Jeff, what is it? February 7th. One week from today. February 7th, okay. I'm not promising that to the school committee, but I'll, I'll get that answer in a couple of days. But if we can't do it, you know, February 7th, we certainly will we'll talk about trying to do it before the, uh, the February, when's our next city council? February 15th, yeah. all right? And um, it, it's just juggling everything. But we're, we're in competition with a lot of committees that are busy. Sure. And, and I, I, we're ju it's just a scheduling thing more than anything, but okay. we got enough work for every other week, no matter what we say. On that favorite motion of everybody? Motion adjourned. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well done. We'll get there.